the elements of the immune system as well as the relationship between the immune system and the vaccination which is a burning topic of the day. I am happy to have a lead panel of national experts who will be deliberating on these topics and as customary we always start our presentation first with honoring one of the top ranking gastroenterologists from Indian subcontinent who has contributed very well to the development of gastroenterology in India. So may I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Ashish Kumar who is my colleague at Sir Gangaram Hospital to take the proceeding forward. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Aroda. So good evening ladies and gentlemen. I bring you greetings from Sir Gangaram Hospital and on behalf of the Delhi Liver Foundation, I welcome you to this webinar on immune response to COVID and the vaccine. But prior to the academic feast of the lectures and discussion on the COVID and its immune response, the Delhi Liver Foundation would like to felicitate one of the stalwart gastroenterologists of India. So as uh, all of you know that from for last uh, about three years, the Delhi Liver Foundation in the memory of Dr. S.K. Sama has been recognizing and felicitating senior gastroenterologists who have made significant contributions in GI and liver field in India and who have dedicated their life in improving the GI and liver health of Indians. Today, the gastroenterological expertise in India is one of the best in the world, beat any field of GI specialty like hepatology, luminal gastroenterology, pancreatic biliary sciences, therapeutic endoscopy. Indian gastroenterologists have made remarkable contributions all over the world. They have produced path-breaking breaking research and remarkable innovations in endoscopic techniques. Today, we would like to honor Dr. Jayanti, who we all know as the teacher par excellence. But before that, I would like to pay our tributes to Dr. S.K. Sama. So I would like to share slides, a few slides about Dr. Sama. I hope my slides are visible. Yes, sir. Uh, so, Dr. Surendra Kumar Swama, uh, a tribute. Uh, Dr. Swama was born on 31st May 1934 at Pirozpur. His initial schooling was at Bilaspur, uh, Himachal Pradesh. He did his MBBS uh, from Medical College Amritsar and obtained his MD Medicine degree from uh, Ames, Delhi. He also received his WHO Fellowship training in gastroenterology from Tufts University, Boston in 1970-71. He had a brilliant career. He started his career by joining his alma mater at Ames. He stayed in Ames till 1974, during which time he established the Department of Gastroenterology at the Ames Institute as well as at the GB Panth Hospital. In 1976, he joined Sir Gangaram Hospital as honorary physician of uh, gastroenterology and served the hospital for 36 years, including as its chairman from 1995 to 2006. While continuing his association with Sir Gangaram Hospital, he founded the multi-specialty hospital, the Sama Hospital in 1982. And he was also the personal physician to the President of uh, India in 2001. At Sir Gangaram Hospital, he founded the gastroenterology department in, uh, uh, which has now grown to become a center of excellence. He held various posts at the Sir Gangaram Hospital, including that of founder member of the board of management and was also a member of its board of trustees. And he was a chairman of board of management from 1995 to 2006. He was a teacher par excellence. He was an excellent teacher and his devotion to academic remained with him till his last breath. He was a role model for many medical students and budding gastroenterologists all over India. He was also a keen researcher and his pioneer medic, uh, medical research in liver disease is well known. He has published 51 high impact articles in various national and international journals. And his 1962 article uh, is reported to be the first attempt at describing the non-serotic portal fibrosis. He is also credited with significant research on hepatitis B and he has always been inquisitive and had a zeal to learn the latest techniques in gastroenterology. His contributions to medical societies were immense. He was a former president and life member of Indian Society of Gastroenterology, had organized six therapeutic endoscopy workshop. He was a life member of uh, Indian Society of Study of Liver Disease, Indian Society of Gastrointestinal and Endoscopy, American Gastroenterology Association and API Association of Physicians of India. He was the president of the New Delhi chapter of IEMA and he was also a board of advisors of the American Hospital uh, management company. He had received multiple awards. The government of India awarded him Padma Shri in 2004 for his pioneering research on liver disease, including non-serotic portal fibrosis and hepatitis B. 
He received the highest Indian medical honor of Dr. B. C. Roy Award in 2004. He was also the recipient of several other awards as uh, Punjab Ratan Award, DMA Ratan Award, Bharat Jyoti Award, Bhaskar Award, Human Care Award, and Delhi Ratan Award. And he had delivered several award lectures such as Presidential Oration, B. L. Kapoor Memorial Oration, K. L. Vig uh, Memorial Oration, and R. S. Dr. R. S. Tiwari Oration. so he is known as the father of gastroenterology teacher of teachers astute physician and able administrator and my heartfelt tribute to dr s k sharma so now i would hand over to dr anup saraya who would uh, read out the citation about dr jayanti dr anup saraya please thank you dr ashish and i think it's my privilege to introduce dr jayanti whom i met long time back in 1987 88 when she used to come to dr rakesh tandon's lab for analysis of gallstone and chemical analysis of gallstones and bile so as we know she passed out from lady haring medical college as a medical graduate in 1975 thereafter she joined md medicine at madras medical college and finished in 1990 1980 then she did her dm gastroenterology from christian medical college bellore in 1984 so then she was also conferred with mams she was an elected member of academy of medical sciences 1988 and elected member of indian college of physician 1997 as far as her affiliation and appointment is concerned she served in tamil nadu state government service for 30 years from 1981 to 2011 on superannuation she joined global hospital as head of academics and research then currently she is working as professor of hepatology and head of the department shri ramachandran institute of higher education and research chennai she as far as awards are concerned during her illustrious career she was conferred with various award like unicam lecturership in gastroenterology in 1998 conferred by association of physicians of india then she is recipient of nacc british digestive foundation award for study of ibd among asian countries in united kingdom 1990 she was a core member of indian society of gastroenterology on ibs ibd gerd chronic pancreatitis h pylori management and gerd management she was a region, she is a regional coordinator for inasel for tamil nadu and puducherry she also supervised thesis phd thesis of various students in university of madras ac technology crystal growth center and institute of hepatotoxicology biliary and liver transplant department of hepatology global hospital she was on the editorial board of indian journal of gastroenterology and reviewer for journal of clinical and experimental hepatology and hepatology international as far as her research interest are concerned she has a wide range starting from butchery syndrome to cirrhosis liver and its complication chronic pancreatitis inflammatory bowel disease gallstone disease epidemiology and various gi disorders largely hospital based studies esophageal and anorectal motility disorders she has published more than 200 original articles in various national international journal she also wrote 65 review articles 47 letters to editors and 18 chapters in various books along with 86 case report i think she is the most deserving person for this prestigious award and now i hand over the proceedings to dr jayanti dr jayanti would uh, you are muted would you like to say a few words uh, good evening to one and all senior faculty members colleagues and friends Um, at the outset, I wish to thank Professor Anil Arora and the trustees of Sir Gangaram Hospital for honouring me with this prestigious Dr. S. K. Sama Memorial Award. I think this is one of the best awards that I've ever received from uh, from the Indian subcontinent, and this coveted award will be the most treasured as it is in honour of a doyen in the field of gastroenterology, and it is, I believe, in recognition because I asked Dr. Anil Arora. Why? Why me? And he said it is for my recognition, for recognition of my contributions in the field of gastroenterology from southern parts of the country. I had few opportunities to interact with Professor Sama during the yearly liver forum or meets organized by Dr. Anil Arora in the first week of September, which is that is what we are missing these days. 
and of course was updated with his vast publications on onslaught of portal fibrosis during my PM training days. A few words on my journey as a gastroenterologist spanning over these last 36 years. My interest in gastroenterology was kindled by late Professor N. Madhana Gopalan, another father of gastroenterology from southern parts of the country, and late Professor Solomon Victor, a cardiothoracic surgeon at Madras Medical College, when, as an MD postgraduate student in 1978, I had to answer a very complex question then, why some cirrhotics did not respond to diuretics? This was the topic of my thesis. This particular work culminated in a monograph called as Coactation of Inferior Vena Cava in 1996, now referred to as Membrane Obstruction of the Inferior Vena Cava. The turning point in my career was my DM training at Christian Medical College Bello under the guidance of Professor Vian Martin, world renowned scientist and gastroenterologist, and my two mentors, whom I'm always grateful to, Professor B.S. Ramakrishna and Professor Ashok Chakri. They taught me, apart from clinical gastroenterology, the human, humane touch towards patient care. As a DM postgraduate, as a, I was assigned a project on gut transit in health and in patients with tropical flu that got published in Gut in 1989. The publication attracted the attention of Dr. John Mabry, a forerunner in the field of epidemiology on inflammatory bowel disease in the United Kingdom. He was instrumental in proposing and recommending my name for the National Association for Colitis and Crohn's Disease, referred to as NAC, British Digestive Foundation Research Study on IBD, among South Asians and Bangladeshis who were migrant populations to the United Kingdom. This coveted award was the first of its kind that was offered to an Asian outside the United Kingdom. My stay in UK in 1990 was rather short, just for a year, but one of the most memorable times in my life, commuting between Leicester General Hospital and the London Hospital London. We studied various epidemiological aspects of inflammatory bowel disease in the migrant population. Research work took off by leaps and bounds, and by the time I returned back to India, I had over 20 publications in all top international journals. On returning from UK, I rejoined the Tamil Nadu State Government Services. My work was divided between patient care, department administration, academics, and research. Clinical research interests included work on chronic pancreatitis with Dr. Suresh Chari, on gallstone disease, which Dr. Anup referred to, and epidemiological aspects of various GI disorders, which were largely hospital-based. To mention a few of our contributions from the southern parts of the country, we were the first to show from South the differences in calcification in alcoholic and tropical gastric pancreatitis, that gallstones in South India were largely pigment, bile was non lipogenic and that gallbladder cancer was uncommon in the southern population. We also reported in 1996 that the third of our patients with irritable bowel syndrome, in fact, had no abdominal pain, and this I presented at the Chandigarh uh, Annual Conference of the ISG, and that esophagitis in the southern parts of the country was usually a mild form belonging to Los Angeles grade A or B, and that Barrett's esophagus was rare. As most of the studies were clinically oriented, publications were in Indian journals with low impact factor. My policy was to publish so that the message was disseminated to the Indian audience never ever bothered about the impact factor. This way, there was a slow recognition of our contributions from South. I started taking place across the way, across, this was uh, largely highlighted by these presentations across the Indian subcontinent. And I was inducted into the various four groups, which Dr. Anup and I had referred to, and thereby started representing my state. Post superannuation in 2011, my interests got diverted to motility disorders of esophagus and anorectin, and more recently to various aspects of liver disease, with special focus on NAFLD at Sri Ramachandra Institute of Higher Education and Research. Bottom line, as you saw in my CV of my research work, was that I was a jack of all trades, but actually a master of none. But I believe that this is what clinical medicine is all about. Teaching has always been my passion. I would take clinics via telemed or have Sunday clinics at home or visit other centers during the weekend. I have visited AIG, I have visited PSG, 
one, the two, and several other centers. We would have a yearly session in the first week of January, apart from the gastroenterology young master's program. Students from across the country would move in, taking care of their own accommodation and travel logistics. And a marathon's clinical session would take place for two and a half days. Ably supported by my pediatric colleague, Dr. Malati, surgical gastroenterologist, Dr. Sharanan, Dr. Mahadevan, a senior endoscopist, and Dr. Raju, a radiologist. And we all together would sit together and we would discuss about 60 to 70 cases within those two, two and a half days. Now, what do I teach? I really do not know, but I do teach students how to take a good history, come to a reasonable diagnosis with history, and finally, most importantly, inculcate the confidence within them while presenting. Now, what has been the outcome? Results would be really gratifying, and more than 90% would come out in flying colors. In these, so, days, in these days of pandemic, our online classes continue on Thursdays at 9 p.m. with Professor L. Nempita Krishnan, senior professor. Just a minute, just a minute. I've done the fresh paint. Be careful, okay? Fresh paint here on the door, and there also <laughs> double coat. I'm in a Zoom meeting, okay? I'll be with you afterwards. So um, I just continue. In these days of a pandemic, our online classes continue unabated on Thursdays at 9 p.m. with Professor Elvendra Krishnan of PhD Coimbatore and Professor Prem Kumar at Madras Medical College Chennai. We as teachers firmly believe that we have an onus and moral responsibility to educate our students so that they carry on the weight into the future. I'm reminded of the famous quote by Roger Kobe, who states that, if you give a man a fish, you just feed him for a day. But if you actually teach him how to fish, you feed him for life. So that's my motto. Now, after joining the Department of Hepatology at SRMC Chennai in 2018, I have wonderful teachers and mentors like Professor L. Venkata Krishnan, and my own student, Dr. Joy Marquis, who teach me hepatology, I can approach them at any time when I have a doubt regarding patient care. And truly it is said, yesterday's students are today's teachers, and today's two teachers are their students. This vicious cycle continues and should continue in a healthy manner. And this is what I believe in. Before concluding, I must make a bold confession. Where do we gastroenterologists from South stand at present? and in the national forum, nowhere. And I believe this is because we have no high impact publications or outstanding research projects, except for those from tertiary referral centers like Christian Medical College uh, Hospital and a few other centers. So in order to remain in the forefront, a small group under the AGs of the Tamil Nadu chapter of the IHG, spearheaded by senior gastroenterologist, Professor Kiara Kainisami, Professor Balasubramanian, Colonel Krishnan, Professor B.S. Ramakrishna, Professor Epen, Dr. Malati, and our vibrant secretary, Dr. Ubal Bus. We have set up a core group and have started multi center studies on various aspects of GI disorders. And it has, we have really succeeded in this. And in, in a short span of almost just about six months or so, we have completed two major multi center projects, one of them which is already in press. So the, uh, the further other thing that has really happened is, this is mainly the reason for this is that seniors like us are really trying our best to hold on to the fort and not allowing the strings to snap so that we continue to represent the gastroenterology forum from the South. The trustees of Tamil Nadu chapter of ISG have also introduced a journal called as Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Endoscopy Practice. And this is mainly to encourage students and faculty to submit articles. In the end, I would like to conclude by thanking God the Almighty and all my teachers, past and present, and my family, who have been a great support in guiding me through happy times during my career. Thank you once again, Dr. Anil, and your team for this honor, which has been a real pleasant surprise for me. I must also thank Dr. Anil for sending me nice, thought-provoking, and encouraging morning messages on WhatsApp, which pulls me up through all odds and blocks in my life. Thank you once again to the uh, trustees and to Dr. Nina. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, giving us an elaborate description yeah. about your journey in the gastroenterology oh. in India. Uh, Dr. Anil, would you like to say a few words about Dr. Jenti before we hand over to Dr. Manish? Yeah, 
thank you ma'am it was a pleasure to listen to your arduous purposeful and fruitful journey in the field of gastroenterology we are all honored by your presence you are still a role model for all of us we go by your simplicity your dedication to teaching and your selfless service to the field of gastroenterology i am sure all the elite panel members would agree with me you are the most deserving candidate from that region today and it will be a pleasure to have you and let me also remind you that uh, your uh, uh, official and the formal medal and the shawl which will be delivered to you because of the logistics of the lockdown we couldn't hand it over to you thank so you very much sir thank you so much and keep sending whatsapp <laughs> messages thank you thank you thank you uh, thank you now we'll uh, start the uh, academic uh, program and i would like to uh, ask dr manish uh, uh, to introduce the topic and then after that dr uh, rakesh kochar to introduce the first speaker so dr manish please so thank you sir it's a great pleasure to be among the stalwarts of uh, gastroenterology in india arora sir thank you for the uh, invite today so it's a very relevant topic that we are discussing today uh, immunity in covid and uh, vaccines so this has been a fascinating journey for all of us regardless of specialties we are all now covid experts and in last one year it has been a phenomenal development where a vaccine has been introduced and it has been rolled out so when the vaccine was being introduced the when was being developed the first thing that came in mind of uh, the immunologists and the researchers was that we have coronaviruses so there are four coronaviruses which are already circulating and they all impart a short, short duration of immunity so it was really a question whether a covid vaccine will be giving a short duration or long duration immunity so these are the very important things that we need to see the immunological memory so now all we know uh, many people are getting tested and then uh, after the vaccination they are getting tested with antibody levels and uh, we do see very good levels but we also see reinfections among the same um, uh, people vaccination and then infection if despite of good level of anti antibodies so these are very important issues that we need to understand that it is not only the antibody levels we have to see all the arms of uh, memory cells that is memory b cells memory cd4 cd8 cells so these are all very important issues that i think which we will be uh, covering today and finally regarding vaccine uh, current understanding is that we need a balanced humoral and th1 directed cellular immune response which would be uh, protective for covid so for example in our own indigenous vaccine covaxin there is this uh, aluminum gel immunizer quinoline which acts as a switch switch to th1 response uh, if the th1 response is less and th2 response is more then the vaccine in fact can lead to vaccine enhanced disease then there is a concept of antibody dependent enhancement so there are lots of issues regarding this immunity and vaccine and today we have very uh, distinguished panel of speakers so we will be covering upon how does the body's immune system respond to virus uh, then touch upon basic differences in natural versus uh, vaccine in this immunity then we have covid vaccine whether it prevents disease or infection and finally we'll talk about covid vaccination which when and how so it's a really pleasure to be here and looking forward to some interesting discussion today thank you i think we set the ball rolling already the ball has set uh, rolled so uh, as elaborated it is an interesting topic and we all so called experts of covid of 2020 and 2021 have a lot to learn we are pretty superficial on in our knowledge we pick up what interests us but this particular session is going to be an in depth session on immunity and covid and to have the first talk on the basics how does the body respond to covid the virus we have uh, dr anil aroda who is a dear friend and uh, he he has actually utilized this covid lockout right from last march the best of all of us in terms of learning and teaching his webinars have been a great hit and we all learn something new in each one of them so this is uh, i must compliment anil for this spearheading this particular uh, webinar series 
and uh, let's see what he has to teach us today. Anil. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh, for those very comforting words. But I would fully agree with you that none of us is an expert. It is a disease which is evolving over a period of time. It is a disease of science, and science is only making us learn more and more. We still do not know the basics, nuances of virus as of now. Are my slides visible, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Greetings from uh, Daily Liver Foundation. My topic of presentation is immune response in COVID-19. Is it too little or too much? As Dr. Manish said, if it is too little, then we do not react to the virus. But the problem is it is too much. But it is a question of timing. When is it too little or too much? Coronaviruses are known to be existent in the universe for donkey's <laughs> years. In fact, more than 5,000 <clears throat> species are known to human beings, of which 500 have been characterized. But something has happened over the last two decades only that these viruses, which are present in the basic animal as hosts, have tried to jump into the human as the second host. And over the last two decades, we have three major virus, viruses epidemics related to COVID and the SARS viruses. The first one was in 2000 Two, that was SARS infection, which was confined to a limited number of the patient and significant number of deaths. The second epidemic related to coronavirus was Middle East Respiratory Distress Syndrome, in which we have a total of about 2,500 cases, and the infection is still smoldering. This is the storyline of so-called, you may prefer to call it a Wuhan virus, but the Chinese were smart enough to delete their name of Wuhan from this region. And finally, it got renamed as a SARS-CoV-2 virus infection by WHO. In fact, WHO declared it as a pandemic on 11th March. And see the basic difference between the first coronavirus infection, that is SARS-CoV, second coronavirus infection in the human beings called MERS, and the present ravaging episode. The total number of the cases and the mortality was pretty confined in these two epidemics. But this pandemic, which is not showing the sign of reversal by any means, has already affected about 16 crore population till yesterday evening, resulting in a mortality of about 33 lakh individuals in the world. But fortunately for us, it is less virulent, but more infective. If you look at the mortality which was happening in the second corona epidemic, that is mers was 34%. Luckily, as of today, our mortality related to SARS-CoV-2 is only about 1-2%. to it is, What is SARS-CoV-2 virus? It is basically a single-stranded enveloped virus, which has a single-stranded HCV, it's a core virus, which is covered by envelope, has membranous protein, and then these are the spikes which are onto the head of the envelope. And that is the reason because it has multiple spikes, it, which look like a crown of the prince. It, these viruses are known to be referred to as coronavirus infections. Peculiar thing about these spikes is that it has a fixed domain as well as variable domain. This variable domain has a propensity and a tendency to have attachment to the ACE2 receptors, which is typically present in the type 1 alveolar epithelial cells. This variable region of the domain part of the spike protein is what gives to the specificity of a particular virus, SARS versus SARS-CoV-2, and the various mutants which are known to be existent in this. How does the virus get entry into the cell? Any in enveloped virus cannot penetrate by default into the cell. And hence, by convention, all enveloped viruses have to be endocytized. So what happens is this virus gets attached to the ACE2 receptor onto the surface of the cell. Then in addition to this, another receptor called TMPR5S2, this leads to endocytosis of the virus. The whole virion gets endocytized by the infolding of this double layered cellular membrane. Once the virus gets into the cell, it quickly fuses with lysosome, which is called endosome within the cell. 
since lysosome has got quite a lot of acidic material it quickly disintegrate the viruses so the m protein e protein spike protein and rna is quickly disintegrated into the various components and you have already a positive stranded rna that means positive stranded rna means it does not need to have a negative strand and can immediately occupy the already ready made machinery of the golgi apparatus and mrna to start translation of the virus into the different parts of the protein so the positive stranded rna quickly get latches on to the pre formed machinery within the human cells to produce large number of the virions which are then assembled into the virion itself and then are extruded out into the circulation to affect the surrounding cells so this is what happens you have a virion which gets attached to the cellular surface with the uh, as2 receptor quickly gets dissolved because of the fusion with lysosome the positive stranded rna first produces a negative stranded rna by this enzyme called rna dependent rna polymerase this negative strand then keeps on encoding the different proteins which are then stored in the cytoplasm at the same time it produces a positive stranded rna which again leads to formation of a negative stranded rna so a combination of replication of the basic rna genome as well as the translation of the viral proteins leads to production of the large amount of the viral proteins which are then assembled onto the golgi apparatus packed up in the endoplasmic reticulum and then are ex exocytized so large number of the viruses are getting multiplied within the cellular machinery of the human body so what does happen what happens in an individual who is normal has no problem with the immunity let's see the virus has entered into the cell once the virus has ent entered into the cell you have the basic defense mechanism in the body which will look at the different components of the virus so you have intraplasmic as well as surface tlr that is toll like receptors which will identify this broken part of the virus as a foreign material and we lead to production of two types of responses one is a interferon production and second is a pro inflammatory cytokine called nf kappa b so these two responses are the innate responses which tend to occur in an individual who is normal so once this infected cell produces interferon this interferon diffuses into the surrounding tissue and gets attached to the interferon receptor of the surrounding non infected nerve cell now once this cell has a interferon which is attaching to the surface of it there is a downstream cascade which leads to stimulation of the stat3 pathways leading to the production of the interferon stimulated genes leading to production of large amount of the interferon so that this new cell will have interferon and cannot be infected from the incoming virus see the original cell which was infected cannot be protected by the interferon but the interferon which is produced by the infected cell is likely to protect the incoming cell what is peculiar with this covid 19 viruses this virus once it is present in the cytoplasm has a peculiar tendency of hiding in something called dmv or double membrane vehicle in this double membrane vehicle the various components of the viruses hide themselves they keep on replicating but they evade from the toll like receptors which are present normally in the intracellular compartment both within the cytoplasm as well as onto the surface of the mitochondria endoplasmic reticulum so these tlr they fail to recognize this abnormal or foreign component of the viral protein since they are hiding in the double membrane vesicle or dmv another thing this virus smartly does is it interferes at multiple steps by which your tlrs are trying to recognize this viral antigens the dna the rna the various components the structural and non structural components of the viruses by inhibiting the response of generation of nf kappa b and as well as interferon production i said i already said in the earlier present in the initial slides that one so virus enters into the cell you have two protective mechanism formation of nf kp kappa b as well as interferon production now look at the virus with its different components it is interfering at every step to produce a protective mechanism of production of either interferon or nf kappa b so that you have large amount of the virus which comes into the circulation so in the covid 19 infection in the first instance there is no response of the body to produce the first defense called interferon so what are you left with 
large amount of the virus comes out into the circulation or into the surrounding tissue, primarily the lung where the virus enters, and then you are left only to the adoptive immunity, either to have a humoral response, which will try to bind the virus and try to neutralize it, or you need to have a cellular response, which will be in the form of uh, ac with activated cytotoxic, cytotoxic T cells, which are going to kill the virus. So you have a paralyzed first line defense in the form of innate immunity. There is a delayed interferon response. It gives you a window period for virus to multiply and reach alveoli. That is the reason compared to SARS-CoV as well as MERS infection, it has a longer incubation period because it, the virus is multiplying within the, within the body. And now you are left only to the mercy of the adoptive immune system to react or not to react. In the normal course of the events, once you have a invading pathogen like CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2, it will produce PAMP, that is pathogen-associated molecular pattern, which will be recognized by the macrophages, which by default, because of the presence of the both membrane and cytoplasmic TLR, is going to generate an innate, innate immune response, which it is trying to get rid of it. But let's see what happens in patients with SARS-CoV-2. In a cell which is infected, you have large number of production, large amount of production of interleukin-6. That is a basic defect in course uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus infection. So this high level of IL-6 produces three major <laughs> problems which lead to immune dysregulation in patients with uh, COVID-19 infection. And these include alteration in the T1-TH2 balance, which Dr. Manish was referring to. Reduce cytolysis of the cells, that means cells which are infected do not get killed and they do not get apoptized. So what happens is you have large number of the cells which don't get killed and then you have a change in the T1-TH2 pattern. How does it do? If antigen producing cells produce large amount of the interleukin-6, this interleukin-6 produces in CD4, interleukin-4, interleukin-4 directs the TH response as Dr. Manish was referring to from Th1 to Th2. Similarly, antigen producing cells with the help of interleukin-6 lead to inhibition of the production of the interferon gamma. So once interferon gamma is not produced, so again, you need interferon gamma to direct the Th cells towards the Th1 level. If you have reduced level of interferon gamma, you will have less of Th1 cells and more of Th2 cells. Second thing this IL-6 is doing is that you have IL-12, which in combination with IL-6 leads to increased production of the SOX3 enzyme, which inhibits the production of the gamma interferon. Once you have less gamma interferon, you do not have activation of the cytotoxic T cells. That means you are having less and less cells which are going to get rid of the infected cell. There is a reduced cytolysis of the infected cells. So infected cells keep on producing cytokines. In addition, a combination of the interleukin-6 as well as interleukin-12 also lead to uh, decreased killing of all the cells which are infected, be it the immune cells, epithelial cells, endothelial cells, leading to persistent presence of the infected cells. Moreover, another thing which happens in patients who are having COVID-19 infection is that CD4 cells produce a substance called TH17 polarization of the T TH helper type of cells. Now this TH17 polarization produces TH17 interleukin and this IL-17 leads to increased production of BCL2 and BCL6. This leads to inhibition of the cytochrome, cytochrome C enzyme which leads to decreased apoptosis. So if you have a CD8 cell which is supposed to kill this virus, if you have increased production of uh, BCL2, you are not able to kill the virus. Similarly, once you have a combination of IL-6 onto the infected cell, it produces large number of the PDL receptors, which will block the PD-1 receptors on the CD8 cells. A combination of increased expression of I TH17 as well as IL-6 lead to decreased apoptosis and increased expression of the PDL1. All that is relevant if you are trying to elucidate the therapy of the virus. So what is happen happening, ladies and gentlemen, you have a virus which comes into the alveoli. Initially, it should have responded to the type 1 interferon, which is poorly available in COVID-19 infection. So once that bypasses the alve alveolar epithelium, so you have large amount of the virus which comes in contact with pro-inflammatory cells. 
and since there is a skewing of the ratio away from th1 to th17 there is a large amount of recruitment of the pro inflammatory cells primarily neutrophils which cause havoc in the uh, lungs so there are three ways by which your body can respond if you have a early interferon response you will have a minimal disease if you have a early replication of the virus and delayed interferon response you are have a excessive disease or severe covid virus infection and if there is no early interferon or late interferon response you will have no disease so basically once you have a virus entering into the cell in the normal course of the event which happens in about 80% of the patients you have early interferon response there is a increase in the pro inflammatory cytokines because of the decreased virion production this inflammatory response is able to get rid of the virus and have protective immunity leading to the survival of the host but if there is a delay in the interferon response you have large number of the inflammatory cells which are coming into the into the circulation and into the tissues that leads to recruitment of the pro inflammatory cytokines leading to the destruction of the region where all this is accumulating that is that is alveoli of the lung leading to ali ards and the finally the mortality and this is precisely the reason that patients who are aged that means there is a direct relationship in between the age and the mortality in aging you have a multitude of the problems like altered nk cell function decreased dendritic cell function alteration in the t cell and b cell immunity and decreased expression of the cytokines from macrophages resulting in immunocompromised state but then somebody can ask if adults do not respond well to the immunity why is it that the children without immunity are not affected by the covid-19 infection in terms of mortality the basic difference between the children and adult is that in adults and old age people you have so called memory cells that means these old people would have at some point of time in the natural history of their life would have been exposed to a virus akin to covid-19 infection they would have memory cells which respond very abnormally in a totally dysregulated manner to the incoming virus resulting in high mortality similarly overweight also leads to it is a driver of the poor t cell function and with increasing obesity you are more likely to have a complication related to covid-19 so what do we have once you get infection with covid-19 depending upon the viral factor host immunity as well as the possibly intervening factors which i think will be better delineated by dr anup and dr manish Uh, we will have either a severe disease or you can have a mild disease or you can simply pass off as a symptomatic carrier so depending on which type which stage the patient comes to you in the early phase you have a high viral replicative stage in the intermediate phase the body is trying to overcome it but if the immune system is very uh, dysregulated and it is a hyper immune state then you are likely to come down with complications so host immunity is responsible for severity of the uh, problem related to the covid 19 this is an elegant study which was published from singapore this has implication in terms of development of the vaccine that the highest amount of the virions were available and present only in the secretory goblet epithelial cells not at the basal cells in the nasal epithelium thereby meaning tomorrow if we have to develop a vaccine a vaccine which is available nasally may be better off than one which is given uh, in intramuscular form so all these what i have explained to you will have excellent relevance in terms of pathogenicity to sum up ladies and gentlemen our goal of understanding the basis of immune system is we should know how does the patient move from asymptomatic stage when the virus is growing in the body to highly infective state and you can still be asymptomatic lack of initial response in terms of lack of development of interferon type 1 leads to viral replication and if you have huge amount of the virus body reacts in a totally disarrayed manner re resulting in hyperimmune response severity and death and this all can be the basis for development of the various drugs which will be covered drugs and the vaccine which will be covered by the subsequent speaker thank you with that i'll stop sharing my slide and hand it over back to the moderators uh thank you dr anil for uh, very elaborate um uh, discussion of the topic how do we respond to how does our body respond to the covid virus uh, as you have pointed out that it depends upon the type of response that is mounted dysregulated or regulated and you have hinted that age and obesity are probably two factors but there are 
many other uh, variables which we do not know as yet. And um, I think as the uh, seminar goes on, we'll have some answers to some of them. So I'll pass on the mic to the next chairperson, Dr. Agarwal. Sir, good evening, sir. Uh, it's my privilege, sir, to be here today and in this uh, seminar. I still remember that along with Dr. Anil, we did the seminar a year back when we had not much of a knowledge about COVID. It was attended by good around 600 people that time and we were still learning what COVID was. And today at least we know that COVID-1, MERS and COVID-2 in fact have got a lot of similarities and probably that is the reason we could, rather our scientists could do some amount of work on developing the vaccine and which we are getting it as of date. So, to keep the ball rolling here, we have a wonderful speaker, Dr. S.K. Tyagi, sir, from Meerut, who started his gastroenterology practice way back in 1978. And he was a pioneer to start endoscopies and hepatology and gastroenterology practice in the Western UP part and alumni from PGI Chandigarh. Dr. Tyagi is going to now speak about and tell us about the differences which he will have uh, to discuss clearly about the immunity through the vaccine or natural and what is the difference in it vis a -vis. Dr. Tyagi, sir, all to you, sir. The slides are running, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Well, uh, it's nowadays very customary to actually give one's conflict of interest. And even though I've never had any conflict of interest, today I have one to tell. I have only one serious conflict of interest, and that is that I'm a good friend of Dr. Anil Aroda, or else I would I have no qualification to be here. And anybody who gets a smile on his face when he sees the logo that I have put representing uh, Anil, uh, he also needs to give the same conflict of interest and accept that we are all here because he is here. It's also uh, the topic that he has given me, the basic differences in natural and vaccine immune induced immunity. In, and the main issue is basic. And I think the man's intelligence, Anil's intelligence lies in the fact that he just put basic when he put my talk in and my lecture in. We are going to be talking a lot about antibody antigen reactions. And with Anil Arora, you always have an AA reaction because once he is spoken, it becomes extremely difficult. You get a complex of different kind rather than an antigen antibody, you get an Anil Aroda complex because you've got to speak after he's spoken so wonderfully well and with such uh, exhibition of knowledge. I also have a conflict of understanding uh, and I'm reminded of the six blind men of Indostan. It was not Hindustan, it was Indostan. And when these blind men went and touched an elephant, they wanted to decipher it. And each one of them, the part that he touched, he described that elephant according to that. Some, one said it's an elephant, the other a wall, then a rope, or somebody said who touched his feet, legs was a tree, a snake, or a spear. But none really knew what they were. And both SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination, they elicit a potent immune response. We know that. And a number of studies have described the immune response to SARS-2 infection. Yet, beyond antibody production, some immune response to COVID-19 vaccination remains, a lot of it largely uncharacterized. And the reason is that we, in our panic, and in our need to get a quick vaccine, within three to four months of this pandemic, we had deciphered the complete, coded the complete virus and gone on to produce the vaccine without truly understanding what the vaccine is doing technically, 
we would have taken several years to understand and today's lecture which i have to deliver would be far more relevant and far more complete because we would have known so much more about the vaccine and what the infection actually does what we know is theoretical and what we know is the part that we are looking at rather than the whole elephant by itself well as basic immune what i am going to be the way you can compare is by the innate immune system and um, anil said that we need to look at the complement and the interferon that whether the two produce equally or not the vaccine and the natural infection as also the adaptive immune system whether the antigen presenting lymphocytes the cell mediated immunity by t cells killer and helper cells the humoral defense by b cells and the memory b cells is it comparable between the two and if it is not comparable between the two what are the implications of the difference that the natural uh, infection and the vaccine would have would have now or have in the future this little bit is exactly what i have said and even uh, anil has told about this slide i put it here to make the slide a little more colorful because otherwise it would have been just dull and drab the adaptive b cells which are rather important and we all keep on talking about the t cells and the b cells are the ones that actually produce the antibodies and the antibodies are the ones that we ultimately measure and we measure and we seek protection and we measure protection by the antibodies produced then we have the memory cells the b cells produce the memory cells which of course are more important once the infection is over and therefore what remains in the memory for the second time around when the virus gets into us so while a lot of talk happens about the t cells it is actually the b cells that we are measuring the activity of and the resultant comparison would also be about the b cells through production through the vaccine or through natural infection the adaptive immune mechanism of t cells of course is we've already talked about cd4 helper cells which bring in other immune systems and stimulate the b cells to produce antibodies specific to that virus or to that component of the virus as is the case in the vaccine or the cd8 cytotoxic cells that kill the cells because these are cytotoxic and they actually kill the cells which are infected by the virus of course with a little bit of help from uh, mhc2 which are expressed on top of these infected cells and again this is exactly what it's showing and it just adds up to what i have spoken and this is the t cell helper cell the th1 the th2 and the th1217 which we were talking about is what causes the dysregulation of immune system here as it would through the poor production or delayed production of interferon as well so at any level if you have a disarrangement uh, a dysregulation the immune system does not adequately respond the assessment of protection against reinfection and i'm not going to talk about reinfection because the next speaker is going to talk about it but what is important is that in the denmark study which was actually a meta analysis 47 studies reported that the zero prevalence of sars 2 or covid 2 based on the zero positivity or the or the response was only 0.37 to 2.7 did not show any antibody response and because that happened it would mean that the serum antibodies were not produced in this many patients persons infected and we have the data here and what it actually says is that basically not all patients who have subjects who get infected by covid 2 will actually develop the antibodies which could range to as high as 22% and 
And yet these persons are fairly protected from reinfection, meaning thereby, and this would make us wake us up to tell our patients and who go and keep on getting the antibodies done, the spike antibodies done immediately after their infection to say that there's much more to it than just the production of antibodies, which happens with the COVID-2 infection. What actually happens is that it's possible that in persons with low levels of neutralizing antibodies, the innate immune response and the T cell response clears the virus. So it's not just the antibodies that are important, but also the T cell response. And some studies, as I've already said, show that this COVID may develop virus specific T cell responses without detectable circulating antibodies. And that is what happens when patients come with a very low or no antibody response and they feel that they've got infected, they underwent everything and landed up with no antibodies. So they are in deep trouble, but that's not the, not the case. And some T cells in persons without exposure have been found to cross react with SARS-2, possibly due to prior exposure to other coronaviruses. That's what Anil said, that the elderly who may have a low uh, immune response, but they have a good set of memory cells and they have been previously exposed and they have developed this, anti this uh, memory cells and they remember how to combat it. It's the experience of the elderly that saves them rather than the immediate response that happens. So the frequency of specific T cells in the resolution phase of mild and severe. So this is rather important. What happens is because we are comparing, we ought to know what happens. And this is the acute phase, which I'm not going to read. Just a sec, I think. So this is what is important. And Peng et al. studied the resolution phase of COVID-19, showing a broadly targeted CD4 here and CD8, which was depicted here, response that happened to specific antibodies, the antigens, proteins. And the total T cell response, that's the solid blue line, is stronger and broader in severe cases here. It's much more than in the mild cases. And if you will see that there are more CD8 cells present in the mild cases than there are in the severe cases. And that's what was said, that the cytotoxic cells being less when you have a severe disease, they are killed far less, but also that the long-term memory, one doesn't know as to what is happening, how are the the T helper cells helping the B cells to produce the long lasting memory. We do not know it either for mild or for severe. As a matter of fact, we do not even know it about the vaccine. And therefore it is what about, we know about the T cell response, but what about the B memory cell response and the long-term effect in these patients? Well, the antibody status as was here and the incidence of SARS-2 infection in healthcare workers. And you'll see that in this longitudinal cohort study, the presence of anti-spike antibody was associated with a reduced risk of confirmed infection over a long period of time, over a 30 week period of time. And the incidence of COVID infection was inversely associated with the baseline anti-spike and anti-nucleocapsid antibody teeters. And here you are. If you did not have the antibodies, which is important, so it's not just the T cells. If you have a good antibody response, which is here, you have far less infection later on, much milder disease, rather than if you have a poor or if you are negative for antibody there. So the natural infection actually creates the antibodies, which are good for all those who've had it. So I think the natural infection that one has is important. It is also seen that the antibody positivity, these are the total antibody positivity. And the risk of documented reinfection was very rare in all those infected persons 
till a few months after they got the first infection. So definitely, when you have a natural infection, you have a significant amount of protection that you are getting. The same may not be true when you get the vaccine. So the initial response and the long and, and the initial response you have to disease is rather good when you have a natural infection. You will also have noticed in a lot of data that the second infection from people who've already had the first infection, reinfection after COVID infection, SARS-2 infection have been very few. However, there have been many more in incidences of infections after getting the vaccine. And the reason again is that the antigen that is presented by the natural infection is very good and you get a lot of antibodies which we are and T cell responses and the type of immune responses which we are not even calculating at the time of giving this talk. So irrespective of the antibody response, reinfection is rare because after the normal COVID infection and that really has to do with something that the body is doing right in response to the COVID infection, especially if one has recovered. And one of the reasons is that although we are less than a year into this pandemic, it appears that the antibodies induced by infection are often of poor quality and the B cell memory cells are limited. And the explanation for long-term, this is good, I talked to you about 30 weeks, but beyond that, an explanation to this for this outcome might be the consequences of loss of germinal centers in COVID-19 patients. What they did was they looked for <coughs> in the lymph nodes for germinal centers, and they found so that these were missing. Like this, you know, when you have the infection, you would have a center which would then produce B cells, the follicles would produce B cells. And these B cells which are produced from these germinal centers have long lasting B cell memory, and the highest affinity pathogen specific antibodies are derived from within this. And therefore, once they noticed this, however, the limitation was that this was done in the patients who had died after severe infection. So the natural infection does create severe natural infection, makes B cells, which are there, but these are not the B cells which are coming from these follicles in the germinal centers, and therefore would probably not be B cell memory cells, and one would not have a very long lasting immunity. So which means poor memory B cells are produced when you have the natural infection. However, the same is not really true when you get a vaccine. And this is what happens in COVID-19 patients, immune responses were characterized by augmented interferon responses, which were largely absent in vaccine. And even though Anil said right at the end that we have a very poor interferon response, and if you saw the slide properly, the very poor response leads on to death or the patient being very ill and not surviving. But majority of the COVID patients do survive, and that is because they have a better augmented interferon response than, as I'm comparing it with the vaccine, than they have in the those who get the vaccine. Those who get vaccine do not have a very highly augmented interferon. What they have, what they actually have is the T cells patients are effector cells and good expanded and were primarily circulating memory cells. So basically you have a good interferon response in a mild case here, but you have a very good, a much better, not very good, a much better B cell response if you get the vaccine. The problem with vaccine is you are not presenting the whole viron to the body to respond. And whichever, anti whichever vaccine you might select today, majority of them, the antigen being presented to the body is the S protein, except in one, which is the, they also have the receptor binding domain being presented, which is in the mRNA vaccines. 
and therefore these produce a far greater T1 and T2 cell dependent adjuvants are also present in these. But if you see this, uh, it's very nice. So you have these and what you present to the body through vaccine is the kind of response you're going to get. Unlikely in a, in a, in a natural infection, you're going to get the whole viron being uh, presented to the body for an immune, to the immune system. And if you see here, if you see here, you have the virus binding antibodies. This is no normal infection. And you have the virus neutralizing antibodies, which are there because all these antibodies are being presented. Even the nucleocapsid antibodies are presented to the body in natural infection. However, when you have vaccination, the best response you would get is when you have the viron-like particle uh, RBD present here in what you're the antigen, and you'll get an extremely good virus neutralizing antibodies. When you present the RNA and you have within it the RBD, which is right here, which is the best that you can present to the body, you have a fairly good virus neutralizing antibody. However, it's just about as good as the natural infection, which you are getting here. Obviously, one would think that if you presented the complete spike S protein as an antigen, the response would be much less than if you present the RBD. And that's truly the case. You get a far poorer response when you present the whole. But mind you, it's not absent. And this plus the natural infection that the RBD also in the natural virus presents to the body plus the other segments that it presents to the body augments the two and you have a fairly good response. That's why a majority of us are surviving. You get a good response to the normal or to the routine or majority of us in a natural infection. This is also one fact that if you take the binding, if you take here the two results, this was the anti s -teters in those who were previously COVID infection positive. And so here was somebody, the, this is the anti-S. So you are not infected and you get infected. And this is the level of average level of antibodies you get. And if you are previously infected, you're already here. So your own natural infection is almost as good as your first, as your first infection. It is when you get this vaccine also previously infected and you get vaccine, you get an enhancement of the uh, immune system, your own immune system, which was already activated by the, uh, the natural infection. And the similar picture is here that if you, whether you are symptomatic or asymptomatic, getting the vaccine over and above the natural infection, the immune system is actually enhanced. And therefore, if you see this impact of prior natural infection on T cell, B cell response on vaccine, you can see here, this are the naive cases. They have neither been vaccinated nor do they have any in, uh, infection. Here, one has had the infection but is not vaccinated. Just concentrate on the dark or the black one. And here they've not got the infection, but only been vaccinated. You have this large gray zone here, but once you get both the infection followed by the vaccination, everything is enhanced. So the SARS-2 infection plus vaccination have an additive antibody response and probably a much stronger response and probably a far greater protective response when you get both these together. This is what brought into focus whether a single shot of vaccine would be enough if you already had infection. But the infection, the antigen presented was entirely uh, of a different nature because it was the whole viron, whereas the vaccine would give you a specific, a part of that, which is going to create the infection. And this is what is being studied now, which is technically called as heterologous prime and boost phenomena in which you give two different kinds of vaccine and see whether the 
same infection, the additive action happens because of these two, just as the Sputnik V has, it has a different adenovirus for the first shot and another one for the second shot. They have the AD6 for the first shot and AD27 for the second shot. And therefore they believe that their response, immune response is different. Susceptibility to circulating, now it's, it's rather variants have become rather important to talk about and do the natural infection and the vaccines have a different kind of antibody response? Well, they did that with convalescent sera, wild type, and different variants were checked here. So here you take the convalescent sera, and if you have wild type, the DG614G, which was the initial, the very first uh, variant that happened, uh, it actually is good, means it's very effective. The convalescent sera is well, very effective. It's equally effective in B117, which is the natural, convalescent sera means the natural infection against the UK variant. However, against the South African vir uh, variant, which is B1351, you have a not so good a response. And as a matter of fact, in three of the 30 patients, they found absolutely no response. Anything below the dotted line is no response. Then you take the various vaccines and these two, this is a Chinese study, but published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they took their two vaccines and found almost similar response in the D614G, almost the similar response in B117, except that the COVAC uh, CoronaVac was far less effective in B117 and absolutely poorly effective in the B1351, which is the South African strain. So primarily you have a different kind of antibody response by the vaccines against these. But if you take the routine convalescent serum, it's not as bad as these. So the natural infection which probably uh, scores a bit over these. And so those who are having a natural infection probably are better protected against even, against even the variants which are happening today. And it's all because of it. Well, to come to this, finally, the one would have to see the analysis of humoral and cellular responses to vaccines will be determined by the robustness of the durability of the protection. In addition, the long-term assessment of SARS-2 B and T cells, memory B and T cells, mediated immune response in patients recovering from infection or those with cross-reactive immunological memory will help to define the future risk of SARS-2 infection. So vaccines and these both have a similar problem that we need more time. And finally, patients recovering from SARS-2 infection may experience a prolonged immune activation, probably due to T-cell exhaustion. So they have a lag period after which the T-cells are depressed, but no such thing is present in any more. So in summary, during natural immune response to SARS-2, high titers of antibodies are also generated against the nuclear protein, the most abundant viral protein. And although antibodies to N are unlikely to neutralize the virus, However, the long lasting B memory and the high affinity of pathogen specific antibodies are derived within the germinal cells in the secondary lymphoid organs are missing. The extent of vaccine boosted cross reactivity, reactive T cell responses, which are induced by most protein subunits and recombinant viral vectors vaccines, which are currently based only in the S protein will be different from those boosted by the multivalent COVID-19 vaccine, such as those based on inactivated virus. So two different viruses, a vaccine would also have different immune response. The natural infection produces probably a more wholesome immune, uh, immune response. Finally, patients recovering from SARS infection may experience a prolonged immune activation, probably due to T cell exhaustion, but no such limitation occurs for the vaccine. So basically we come back to knowing rather little 
and we get back to the story of the six blind men and though it is a five para poetry i'll just mention the last one which is it was the six men of hindustan to learn much in climb who went to see an animal though all of them were blind that each by observation might satisfy his mind thank you very much i hope we no longer remain blind and very soon the blindfold is taken off our eyes and the six blind men which sat six s y k s sykes wrote as hindustan is turned into the wise men of hindustan thank you very much anil you can give a smile you are seeing appearing too serious and i'm sure my lecture wasn't that captivating or uh, cerebral that one becomes so thoughtful thank you very much thank you sir it had been a lovely exhaustive detailed explanation about the innate and the humoral responses and immunity so sir at the end you know you have made one point very clear that the natural immunity is the best and these injections which we are getting or the vaccines which we are getting from outside they may do something good they may not and we do not know how long they last no i did not say that i only said that the data at the moment suggests that okay. for the immediate for the first 30 40 weeks the immune response that we get from natural infection is fairly wholesome the number of patients we have of second infection with covid is far less than we have the failure of vaccine however the vaccine is going to be dependent it's already shown its efficacy in reducing not the infection but in reducing the disease which is going to be talked about later Later. but what the vaccine and the natural infection have not yet proven is what is the degree of b memory cell stimulation that's going to happen in the future that's because still we do not have the antibodies you know long lasting at all so let us i have what- neither the antibodies nor the cerebral inclination to tell you anything more than what i have told you <laughs> well sir so uh, dr kocha sir uh, i mean would you take over the proceedings and introduce the third speaker sir dr situ babu sir <clears throat> dr kocha sir i think you are muted okay dr agarwal you can introduce dr yeah. situ babu and uh, well, may i request you to please tell the audience to type their question in the q and a session and the chat so that we can answer those queries later on you sir uh then next we have dr setu sir who is going to tell us about the vaccines and uh, the thing which is there here is very clear that dr setu babu is an alumni from panel institute of medical sciences and he is a great academician a great teacher and outwardly no doubt about it and when sir speaks you know he makes things really very good humorous and uh, easily understandable so may i ask dr setu sir to uh, come up with his deliberation on the topic of this vaccine to re- keep the roll bowling okay thank you very much uh, anil after listening to two great talks uh, by dr uh, anil and dr tyagi who spoke so much about uh, immunology what which all looked like uh, something like the old wine in a new glass uh talking about the same thing like cd4 cd8 cd17 cd18 and then th1 th or tnf and all those things i think the same so when we looked at uh, you know the so called pandemic we started actually learning so much uh, uh, when i was uh, probably an undergraduate i was told that if you know syphilis you know everything when i was uh, you know post graduate they said if you know hiv you know everything now it seems we are telling our students if you can know every, anything everything about covid you probably know everything i think this is a slide which i picked up uh, how far true i really do not know but it tells me that we are still at a comfortable zone as far as the cfr is concerned uh, that's a happy note to begin with and to to me it appears as if is the pandemic slowly coming down and thanks to the vaccine rate is slowly increasing we'll discuss the problems uh, later so i think uh, this came as a boom it never happened 
and uh, when hepatitis b was not known the vaccine wasn't known so easily and uh, i think now we have started even robots treating the disease so vaccination go back to the basics is actually the administration of a vaccine to help the immune system to develop protection from a disease That your slides slides, 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 slides are, not slides are not visible oh what happened what happened uh, sorry mm. okay i thought you were just speaking extempo yeah oh no 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 um okay what you not share sir you have to share the screen sir no i did it uh, okay i did now i did it i did it i did Okay, this was my first slide. Okay, uh, I I just go a little uh, the, the, go back. Take a minute. So probably one of the most uh, horrible features uh, pandemic is that propaganda, all the screaming and lies, hatred comes invariably from people who are not actually inside the pandemic. Some of us we, who actually we faced the pandemic, we know what it means. Uh, everything. Uh, so i was actually looking at uh, this particular graph which i was mentioning that uh, we still at a comfortable zone if this is true i think we are very happy about it now i look at the you know the graph which is so called the wave pattern i think it seems the wave is slowly coming down this is a very very encouraging and the vaccine uptake is slowly increasing we won't go into the micro details and this is uh, the thing that happened is everybody started responding positively to the vaccine so this is my slide where i probably would like to start vaccination is the administration of a substance or vaccine to help the immune system to develop protection from a disease we all know that it contains some microorganisms they are either weakened live or in a killed state or proteins or toxins of the organism now it's surprisingly uh, taking the time shot to mention that we have the rna vaccines which are the most researched molecules we have the entire virus as a uh, you know a vaccine which is inactivated like the polio which we have been hearing and then we used a peculiar word job in fact i was not aware of this particular word job so much as what i started learning the verb job is originally a scottish and it used to you know pecking of birds and then probably job is also used as a hypodermic injection by these morphine and cocaine friends i think job is one peculiar word which i have learned during this okay the sars covid as the highest genetic homology with the bat virus suggesting there is a zoonotic origin we are not still sure who hans and zoonotics and we are all just mentioning to understand the most striking feature of uh, covid is it is efficient human to human transmission that's what we saw and uh, you know it, it rapidly spreads it has a reproductive number that is by which the infectivity rate is something like 2 to 4 that one man can infect 8 to 400 people which is responsible for the current uh, pandemic and the reservoir and intermediate host is human himself we don't have additional reservoir though um, you know in one of our zoos the tigers were shown phone to be positive which made a big headline but subsequently nobody could actually do whether it is a false positive or a true negative we really do not know very quickly i won't go into this now we were looking at what is called the extra pulmonary covid which is now bothering and the ent people are now you know you know that the mucor mycosis story probably the four important tests which we still go on we want one of them to be positive to be treating the patient the extra pulmonary manifestations given in books and literature i don't want to discuss but suffice to tell that we have a huge problem when the patient presents to the unit he has got so many other things like you are referred for a, an uncontrolled diarrhea and to our shocking that you know that the feces is positive for coronavirus the drugs for covid the less we discuss i think thanks to anil who has not included that particular topic otherwise it would have a mess up <laughs> the question then suddenly starts do you need to treat all cases i think uh, that's one question but then let's focus on the vaccination because the treatment is to be discussed separately 
I think this is something which we never imagined that has happened. So let me make a few statements. It was probably a year back when the new medicine started saying we need to develop a vaccine at the pandemic speed. The way pandemic came, we want. Vaccine hesitancy now became a vaccine urgency. We have used a certain peculiar word, which I honestly never heard, vaccine nationalism, global equality in healthcare and human rights, the export of vaccine, is it an obligation or maitri? The import of vaccine is probably the need of the hour. The randomized vaccine allocation, in fact, a state versus central subject. And we are awaiting authorization without even a bridging trials. Earlier we say, do you have adequate RCTs to prove that vaccine is better than placebo? No, we are bypassing all those things. And case clustering adds so much that a clinician in a larger hospital is confused between a case load and vaccine. We run two different buildings, one for vaccine and one for the cases. So we use all these terms called the lockups, lockdowns, and probably lock opens. Now we have vaccine protests and this became a big issue. And it happened really. I thought this happens only in the developed countries. This is all the European countries which initially said we don't want vaccine. And it was true that when the vaccine was first introduced in January, there were at least 56% which did not want to take the vaccine. In fact, the vaccine went what is called vaccine waste stage. Probably at the end, while we are bridging between the disease and vaccine, the mask still came to our risk. In fact, people were punished if there is no mask. Now, today, can you say that I have uh, taken the vaccine, I don't need a mask, and that's what uh, the American government says. Okay, now, what are the vaccine queries we have? The safety. Um, go back. The efficacy, availability, distribution, who pays for the vaccination, indigenous versus imported, and post-vaccinal issues. I won't concentrate all the above. Take up a little bit on the post-vaccine element. What is the absence of a clinical trial mode, which became an important uh, issue when there was an authorization? That means you can take a vaccine with a consent and there is a no indemnity or liability on the party which has given the vaccine. This can be discussed uh, when it comes. And this is what happened with one of the vaccine, which is was still recent, little recently, under a trial basis. And you need an informed consent to take the vaccine for prophylaxis. Then there is a big confusion about the age. Now, government was in a hurry said probably they thought we have enough stocks, so we can say, let's start 60 plus, 45, 60, 18, 45. And now there is an active trial going on in pediatric population with vaccines. So I think back to a beautiful word, the universal immunization, which is likely to hit it. Now, what is the post vaccination issue? That was one of my interest. Since the start of vaccination campaign, the development of COVID-19 has been reported in persons who have received one or both the doses. Now, how to explain this? All these years, I was thought if you take a vaccine, you won't get disease. Let me compare with hepatitis B. If I take hepatitis B vaccine, I won't get hepatitis B. Now, you can always talk about escape, mutants, and all will come to that. The two universities, uh, University of California and Los Angeles, uh, they had a, began to vaccinate their all healthcare workers. And from December 16, 2020 through February 9, almost around 36,000 healthcare workers have been receiving the first dose. And similar number uh, is almost about uh, 28,000 received the second dose. Read carefully among the vaccinated healthcare workers, 379 unique persons tested positive. But this is in the first one week. That means nobody can test positive within that one week. Now, my million dollar question is, can I equate him with a disease? A mere positivity, can it be equated with a disease is a question to be discussed. Now, after receiving both vaccination, that 
57 healthcare workers tested positive. 22 had positive test results one to seven days after the second day. So what happened as of February 9, that was almost completing the vaccination procedure, 5,455 healthcare workers and in one of the San Diego and 9535 at the Los Angeles received second dose. And what is their positivity rate? 0.05%. Obviously, vaccination does protect from the COVID infection has been proven beyond doubt. Okay, look at uh, what happens to the number of people with infection as the days pass by, the infection rate comes down. That means, you. what is the lesson that we have learned is even if you are vaccinated, the, after the second dose of two weeks, you need to be careful from an exposure because your chances of getting an infection within the two weeks of the last injection or the second injection, you are liable for infection. I think that's a very good message which we need to pass on. The rarity of positive results are 14 days after the administration of second dose. Look at the immunogenicity and safety. I was actually saying, uh, how can it be comparable to hepatitis? We took a small clue, which was a very interesting uh, data published in this month, Lancet. And they looked at what is called triple antigen vaccine. Now, you have single antigen vaccine, now triple antigen vaccine. This is, of course, hepatitis B, since most of us are uh, from the GI, we might be interested in looking at this. So this triantigenic vaccine seems to be better than single antigen. That means there will be a future, which was already actually mentioned by Tyagi, that we might look at polyvalent rather than a monovalent vaccine. The vaccine and variants, maybe I'll make a, a pleasant reading, regardless of the platform on which the vaccine is based, you still have a fixed immunogen and a virus that is changing. And sooner or later, you are going to get a mutant that evades that what we call the vaccine escape mutants. And this virus is like, yep, uh, I got plenty of people uh, which I can infect. And the more I replicate, the more I can mutate. Now, does it mean that the more number of people are infected, we are going to get more? But learning is that as the virus passes down, it loses its virulence. Is it happening? We need to check it out. Then we another area of uh, importance would be vaccine resistance. Uh, okay, sometimes we call them as non-responders. This happens even in hepatitis B, that you have a small cohort of people who do not respond. And we make a lot of uh, alterations by increasing the dose of vaccine, by increasing the duration from three to four, or we add colony growth stimulating factor to make them effective. Like uh, CKD patients get a different schedule compared to healthy people. So three statements I want to make. The vaccine protects by targeting multiple virus epitopes simultaneously, thereby generating robust protection. This is what is important in Tyagi's lecture also, where he mentioned that you do get robust antibody response. Probably it may not be measurable or the antibody half-life is small that at the time of your measuring, the antibodies could be low. We have seen actually somebody having 1,000, somebody having 50. Uh, does it mean anything as we have in hepatitis B, about and you are protected, healthcare workers require 100 units. I think similar thing also applies here. The vaccine suppresses the pathogen growth within the host and stops transmission from vaccine protected hosts. I think this is, has something to say that tomorrow when you vaccinate people, these people, even if they get infected, they may not transmit the disease to that extent, need to be verified. And the vaccine-induced immune response protects against all circulating serotypes is to be contested because whether all you know will be protected. As of now, for example, an mRNA vaccine might even protect uh, B1617 variant as has been shown in the literature. What is the association between vaccination and one particular uh, 
you know vaccine and the incidence of symptomatic and asymptomatic infections and everything looked at healthcare workers because it is easy to trace them unlike community we haven't yet gone very seriously into the community now a randomized clinical trial have provided estimates of the effect against symptomatic but its effect on asymptomatic infection remains unclear because we were not doing pcr to all those people who are vaccinated so we still do not know that small percentage whether somebody is getting asymptomatic infection or are you looking at those hbsag carrier like phenomenon where you have a pcr positive you don't have a disease and somebody said pcr positive it is a dead viral rna and not a diseased rna this i have just mentioned so what is happening today in our scenario this is about 3 days old total number of people received the vaccination are around 100 lakhs and the people tested positive after taking the disease is 0.04% and a similar ranking comes together these two indian vaccines and i have already shown one of the mrna vaccine uh, which is two trials both in israel and china have shown very low positivity rate in those people who received vaccine then the question came can you get infected after getting covid vaccine i think these are so called the breakthrough cases and cdc says there are multiple factors that affect how a vaccine works in the real world so cdc has clearly and even who said you might get another infection after a vaccination but time and again which was also shown in my two previous speakers that the disease tends to be milder moderate may not require powerful therapy so immunity king actually depends on number of things which we know and it has been discussed quite at length but i think one point that is after two weeks of the second dose you are reasonably protected from a new infection or even if you get a new infection the disease tends to be milder now this is what happened uh, in a recent one we got eight positives even one actually was playing the game and then we have a small one i don't know i, I must ask for pardon from uh, professor datta that uh, this is something which happened i was actually attracted that somebody took one vaccine first and second vaccine first now to make it brief all the vaccines are different their platforms are different we have couple of mrna vaccine now we have got a dna vaccine and majority of them are developed on the chimpanzee cell lines and you have the basic vector based vaccines now we look at the particular vaccine which is uh, the so called the covaxin is actually the full virus whereas you take covishield it is against a spike protein so aap log show dalne se baat so is it better me so um, ஒரு <laughs> there is a low case fatality rate hospital statistics do say and the reasons of fatality are different may not be you know attributed to virus alone looking at the new antivirals we are actually initiated a trial on monolipravir and uh, we started recruiting the patients and uh, judicious use of steroids i think uh, a day can be spent on the role of steroids uh, wrong timing right timing right dose right drug and uh, how do you ch- check this early check and look for thrombotic issues i was wondering why some young people are dying and or they said he was all right yesterday he was all right today and uh, you know he is no more tomorrow probably due to some thrombotic event which we have and uh, we lot of people can sepsis as usual is the factor and there is something called long covid follow up we have actually 48 people waiting for a lung transplant registry in our own hospital which is actively doing lung transplant vaccines have reduced new infections to a great extent that was the crux of my this one the new infections are often tend to be asymptomatic 
the post vaccinal issues are not addressed completely we haven't addressed because the long covid is a syndrome where uh, convalescence or body pains absenteeism to the work everything and the risk benefit of vaccine overrides so so much has been discussed and there could be a discussion which probably usha would agree uh, address the need for a third dose or boosters uh, i think this is my last slide i think uh, mm, the famous picture you know where i think we now move to lifting the cylinders and uh, everybody says uh, you know you have failed who says cdc cdc is who who says in cell in this i think i think this game is going on i think what we need to probably look at it is something more to learn and covid has really taught me thing thank you very much for your patient listening excellent celebration uh, sir it has been a wonderful one lots to learn about as i think sir you know we learn from influenza a and b that a polyvalent strain in fact is important you know i mean to be uh, injected for getting a benefit the same is probably going to come even with covid as the time is going to uh, tell us about it and people getting post covid vaccination pos- uh, positivity is in fact is quite high and now let us see you know whether moderna pfizer covid shield covaxin etc etc what dr usha datta madam has to say she is an alumni from the university of medical sciences a professor at pgi chandigarh now so <clears throat> friends let us listen from our penultimate speaker professor dr usha datta ma'am ma'am all yours now thank you so much uh, professor agrawal and dr anil arora for inviting me for this uh, talk and it is actually a very difficult thing why i would say that is everybody in india is now a covid expert of some form or the other so it's like taking coal to new castle and it makes my job that much difficult but i have focused on just the practical components uh, which we need to know uh, rather than you know all the details which is there in literature so the aim of vaccination is to prevent infection to prevent severe disease to reduce transmission and to achieve a herd immunity of 70% so that is our aim vaccine development usually happens in series from preclinical in animal studies then healthy volunteers and selected population general population and then finally to the public but because of covid becoming a pandemic everything has happened in parallel things have all got telescoped into a shorter time however the safety and the efficacy data is very important and we need to continue to follow this literature for some more time till we know the actual truth so right now we are just seeing bits and pieces of what may emerge as truth so we should keep our eyes open for literature which is emerging lot of it has been already spoken about the corona virus but all that i would say here is that even this slide has been discussed uh, by all the speakers which has made it easy but all that i would say is it is the spike protein which has neutralizing antibodies and that is what we need to target so it is the only neutralizing antibody which has been shown to prevent infection and decrease severity so all our vaccine strategies are primarily based on generating sufficient adequate amount of neutralizing antibody to the spike protein so what are the various vaccine strategies the first is to give a live attenuated sars covid vaccine sars covid virus i am sure all of you will realize that this is not the strategy which we would like to use in a pandemic because we do not know how to attenuate it well and maybe this is also not a natural virus that we do not know how it's going to behave so this strategy is out comes the next strategy that is a inactivated virus that means you take the virus you inactivate it chemically so that the virus is no longer alive it cannot go and multi multiply however it can present the proteins to the immune system for generating an immune response so this is the second strategy which has been used it is simple and easy to do 
the third strategy which moderna and pfizer have used is that from the virus mrna is made mrna is put into liposomes micro liposomes and that is injected so when this goes in this will produce an antibody to the protein uh, which is generated by these mrnas the next strategy is that you take the virus you convert it into rna you convert it into dna and put it inside a vector so the vectors which are traditionally used we know already from various vaccination strategies which we have used in the past are adenoviruses so adenoviruses we know how to attenuate them and use them as vectors to carry the protein into the host uh, to the vaccinated person and the other strategy is to use the protein subunits so that means you take the rna go into dna and then you inject that into cell cultures maybe e coli and from that make a lot of proteins like how we do for hepatitis b and inject that into the uh, patient so that you can elicit the response so when we look at the live attenuated or inactivated we discuss that chemically you inactivate it like this or you attenuate it and as i said in uh, corona we do not want to take this strategy so this strategy has not been used and the one which has been used is a inactivated dead virus so when that gets into the vaccine it goes into the cell produces the virus uh, virus will produce those antigens and those antigens are expressed by the antigen present we get a immune response so the covaxin is a typical example of a inactivated dead virus so you take the virus kill it and present the proteins to the immune system the next method is a viral vector vaccine in which you can have a virus you can take the dna of the corona and put it inside say an adeno virus and then you, this virus can be an attenuated virus which can replicate or it can be a non replicating vaccine so irrespective of the strategy all that you are doing is you are putting the spike protein inside a virus and injecting the virus into the patient and if it is a non replicating one it will directly present the antigen if it is a replicating one it will replicate and then present the antigen so obviously you realize that if a virus replicates it will produce more immunity but however if the person has a natural antibody to this virus that is the adenovirus this strategy will fail and also in immunosuppressed people you are always worried whether this a uh, virus can create some other disease problem so this is a safe strategy but it is less efficacious so the typical example of this is covid shield and sputnik uh, this has a 77% efficacy this has a 92% efficacy so we see that here we have used the viral protein put it put that dna inside an adenovirus and then we send it into the system to produce more Uh, antibodies and because it is an adenovirus when it goes in and it replicates it also elicits an anti uh, an interferon response which causes a transient reaction next are the most interesting part of this whole viral pandemic is that we have realized that we can use the dna and rna as vaccines which is a completely new novel strategy and second thing is it was tried for the first time and it has been found to be effective so it is the rna of the virus which is taken in and enters into the cell and because it's an mrna it can directly translate into the viral protein and these proteins are expressed and result in an antibody response the other option is to use a dna vaccine which you put the dna into the uh, into a vector and then that dna converts into an mrna and produces the antibody so this is the basic strategy for all our vaccines it depends on what are we giving to the patient to elicit the response so this is the one uh, the dna vaccine is being in phase 2 by zydus cadila and it is the rna vaccine which has been used by moderna and pfizer which has very good efficacy of 95 and 94% each 
The other one is the protein-based vaccine. Novavax has been trying this with an 89% success, and this is similar and akin to our hepatitis B. So protein is injected and elicits a response. The protein can also be put on a virus-like particle, and this has uh, this elicits a better immune response than this one. Okay, so if we look at these comparison of these five major types, first is the DNA and the RNA vaccine. We see that the design of this is very easy. It was very easy to make. It allowed rapid production, but we did not know about the safety. So it was a gamble which was taken. It had good immunogenicity, 95%. And this has been used by Moderna and Pfizer. The problem with that has been the storage temperatures of minus 20 to minus 80. And the problem was it was a new concept. The next Any problem, mobile phone there? The live attenuated one is, as I said, difficult. It is like the MMR strategy. It has to take another five, 10 years of understanding this, how to use Corona in this mode. So it is not safe. Immunocompromised. Excuse me, can somebody mute themselves? Who were... So the inactivated virus is the one which we are using in Covaxin. This is similar to our polio virus and it has about 80% efficacy. It is rapid for production and it is easy and safe. And this needs only 2 to 8 degrees. The subunit vaccines are also easy and the viral vector which has been used in Covishield again allows rapid production and has decent safety profile. So right now there have been 99 clinical trials on various vaccines and 184 are still in the preclinical stage. So all components of the virus has been used in varying ways for trying various vaccines. So the major candidate ones are by Pfizer, which is in USA, 95% efficacy. Moderna, again in US, 94% efficacy. Sputnik from Russia, 92% and is getting introduced into India today. And Janssen, 72% efficacy. So Janssen has had certain problems related to coagulation issues as well as its efficacy has not been very great, but it had the advantage of a single dose vaccine. Covaxin, which has been produced by Bharat Biotech along with ICMR, has an 81% efficacy. And Covishield, which has been produced by using the antigen which uh, Oxford had, and with that, in collaboration with that, that has 77% efficacy. Novamax, as I said, was 89% efficacy. It is still going through trial phases. So when you get the first dose of vaccine, you get a primary immune response. Note that it is on the 14th day that you start getting the primary immune response. And when you give the second vaccine after four weeks, you get the secondary immune response and that is faster. You can see the slope is uh, uh, more acute and it reaches a higher height. So a second dose results in better antibody response which is faster after the second dose and more likely to reach protective levels of the antibodies and this is a standard way when any virus whether it's hepatitis b or corona first initiates the innate response that is characterized by interferons and this interferon suppresses the replication of the virus and after that, the virus level goes up. And after that, it is the cellular response and the antibody response to IgM and IgG. But most important here, I want to say in this slide is the innate immune response, which is the, through the interferons, inhibits viral replication. And Zydus yesterday announced that they are going to be giving interferons. Uh, they're going to get that into the market for inhibiting viral replication. So what is vaccine efficacy? It is the attack rate in the vaccinated minus attack rate in the unvaccinated divided by the attack rate in the unvaccinated into 100. So this is the formula which is used for efficacy. So one is zero conversion, which is used in phase one and phase two trials. Phase three trials have focused on efficacy, which is the most important for the clinician. So WHO has said risk reduction by 50% is acceptable as a criteria for vaccine efficacy. 
So the Moderna study came as phase three in December in NEGM, and that showed an efficacy of 94%. Pfizer again in NEGM in December 2020, phase three showed 95% efficacy. Then come the, the Janssen, which came in April 2021, phase three trial, again, 60 to 76% efficacy, single dose vaccine. The Oxford vaccine was phase one and phase two, showed that there was a good immune response and it is a safe thing. And that is why India took on using this particular antigen for the process of making the vaccine. And uh, the Oxford vaccine showed that after 40 days, the antibody response was very good and was equivalent to that seen of the convalescent plasma of patients with COVID. So this tells us that after the vaccination, there is a significant immune response, which may be equivalent, but I agree that it will not last as good and will not generate as many memory cells as an active infection with COVID. So similarly, cell-mediated immune response also had a boost, which was uh, identified. And thus, this showed an efficacy of 70% in a participants of about 23,000. This was published in The Lancet. And then recently, we have noticed that there has been increasing duration of time for the COVID shield. Why? Because the recent study shows that for a six week, if less than six weeks gap, you get 55% efficacy. But if you increase the gap to more than 12 weeks, you get, are getting 81% efficacy. So you are improving the efficacy by making the uh, increasing the gap. So what do we have? We have Covishield, that is the Covishield vaccine, which is a vector vaccine. That means it has an adenovirus around it. It has the antigen within it, the DNA within it. And this has been produced by Serum Institute of India in collaboration with ICMR, Oxford and AstraZeneca. PJMER was a part of this vaccine trial and the efficacy was 77%. So the Indian co-vaccine phase one studies showed that this was also safe and enhanced immune response. So <coughs> it was also found recently that it reduces severe cases in about 100% and 78% reduction in all types of cases. So then this came the co-vaccine. Co-vaccine was produced by the Bharat Biotech with ICMR and National Institute of Virology in Pune. So basically it was an inactivated killed type of vaccine. It is an indigenous vaccine and the phase three trial is continuing and the efficacy has been found to be 81% and the side effects have been lesser and it also covers against the various strain, mutant strains which are being seen now. So the co-vaccine went through three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. All that I would say is that they chose a six microgram dose for the final phase three and found an efficacy of 81%. And the dosing interval used in this study was four weeks. So the Sputnik V, again, phase three trial shows 92% efficacy, which was published in the Lancet. So what are the practical aspects of vaccination? This slide is the most important for all of us to take home. Pfizer is the only one which has tested in 12 years plus. All the others are 18 years plus. Second is uh, the dose really doesn't matter to us. This is just a technical component. The volumes are usually about 0.5 ml, except for Pfizer, which is 0.3 ml. All require two doses, except Janssen, which requires only one dose. The intervals is three weeks in Pfizer, four weeks in Moderna, three weeks in Sputnik. Covaxin is four weeks. And now we have increased the thing in Covishield to 12 to 16 weeks. So this is, again, something of importance to us, that Covaxin is four weeks. And only COVID shield is 12 to 16 weeks. And now that Sputnik is coming, it is three weeks gap. All the roots are intramuscular. Intranasal is being developed by uh, in India also right now by Bharat Biotech. The cost of the vaccines are uh, 
for Sputnik, about 1,200 for Covaxin, and about 700 for uh, 700 to 900 for Covishield. And the efficacy is something we can compare here across. And let us start with Covaxin, which is 81%. So Covaxin in India has given us the best results. And Covishield is 77%. And Pfizer and Moderna are in the range of 90, 95%, and Sputnik is coming with 92%. So obviously, Janssen is out of the circle. Just one second. Yeah, so whom to give the vaccine? This is another very important slide. Age more than 18 years in India. Any patient with inflammatory bowel disease, liver disease, immunosuppression, organ failures, transplant recipients, all of them can be given vaccination. But we think that they may not elicit the same amount of immune response and hence they may require a booster sometime down the line. The second is patients on anticoagulants and antiplatelets. They can be given the vaccine. Only thing, use a thinner gauge needle and give a local pressure and don't rub minimum pressure for about two minutes. Patients who are on immunosuppression, who are receiving chemotherapy or rituximab or prednisolone, if you have to start the cycle a little later, avoid it during the vaccination period for minimum four weeks so that the patient can elicit the immune response without immunosuppression. People with dermal fillers have had local uh, swelling and that is not a contraindication to give the vaccine. So what are the contraindications? Definite contraindications are anaphylaxis to the previous dose or a component of the COVID-19 vaccine because along with all vaccines, there are always certain components which are added for immunogenicity to augment and immediate reaction to a previous dose, fever. If the patient is having fever due to some other illness at that time, you don't want to give the vaccine. And pregnant and lactating women in India, we have still not recommended for use in them. However, US has recommended it for pregnant and lactating women, Pfizer and Moderna. So in which situations do you defer vaccination? If a patient has had COVID infection and he has received convalescent plasma, do not give vaccination for 90 days. If they have received monoclonal antibodies, again, do not give it for 90 days. If the patient has had an active COVID infection, uh, the, there is a little bit of variability in this recommendation. Uh, CDC and WHO says that once they are out of quarantine, you can give them vaccine. Uh, many people would like to agree that we wait for four to eight weeks for the body to recover and then you give the vaccination. Anybody with acute symptoms who's hospitalized, we do not like to give the vaccine. Uh, those with clotting factor deficiency, coagulopathy or platelet disorders, there is a little bit of caution in these patients because there is a risk of thrombosis. And however, it is not a definite contraindication. It has to be done under supervision. Pregnancy, as I said, there's only limited data with Pfizer and Moderna. And they have found that the complication rates are similar to the non-pregnant people. And hence, it is recommended the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends Pfizer and Moderna. However, in India, we have not yet recommended. In pediatric age group, very interesting that pediatric age group, they have more ACE levels, but lower ACE2 expression, which is important for this virus. And hence they act as carriers. They're susceptible to the COVID virus. However, have only mild symptoms, but if they develop symptoms, they can have a multi-system inflammatory syndrome like Kawasaki disease. Trials of Oxford is carrying on with six to 17 years, Sinovac, is going on from three to 17 years. We don't have the data as yet. And Pfizer has shown that between 12 and 15 years, it has a 100% efficacy and a strong immune response. And they are going for emergency authorization for vaccination in children. Travel recommendations, WHO says there is no requirement to, for any travel to be vaccinated. However, CDC says that if you're fully vaccinated, 
you can you, you don't need any prior testing before travel out of us and there is no mandatory quarantine so travel subgroup people are best taken care of by masking and social distancing and preferential vaccination to this group will create a problem in vaccine supply so what are the side effects there's been a lot of talk about side effects but no serious side effects has been reported till now vaccine in general are safe and well tolerated there can be local site reaction in the form of itching induration swelling redness warm tenderness which subsides over 2 or 3 days and systemic symptoms of malaise muscle ache joint pains fatigue nausea headache and chills feverishness it can be seen in a large number of patients however it lasts for only about 2 days if the symptoms last for more than 3 days it is important to consider it to be due to covid-19 infection and patient should be tested for covid-19 they should not be just passed off as post vaccination issues and there is a rare side effect of 1 in 100000 of blood clots in the brain and but overall the benefit outweighs the risk and the incidence of anaphylaxis is 4.5 mil 5 cases per a million dose and it usually occurred in people with allergies and occurred within 30 minutes so that is why 30 minute observation after vaccination is recommended this is the situation which we are all interested in that thrombosis or thrombocytopenia is a rare condition in covid shield occurred in 1 in 26000 in jansen it occurred in 1 in 5 lakh 33000 and occurred more often in women in both age groups and it mimics the autoimmune hit syndrome the onset is usually 4 to 20 days after vaccination the platelet count drops and they have elevated d dimers they have a positive anti pf4 antibody and they have atypical sites of thrombosis and it is also important to rule out active covid infection because there also you can have thrombosis the treatment with that is usually direct acting anticoagulants or direct thrombin inhibitors or fandopirinols so where are we in india where are we going ahead we have already covid shield and covaxin now a dna vaccine is being developed by cadila sputnik is coming in with reddies and then we are having protein subunits which is being tried in pune recombinant proteins in hyderabad and mrna is also being tried in genova pune in collaboration with us and they are also using the inactivated rabies vector uh, platform uh, in collaboration with us and we are also having the arvido pharma in hyderabad trying another platform so is vaccines which allowed the simple answer is no if you have taken covaxin you take covaxin if you have taken covid shield you take covid shield if you have taken covaxin don't go on to sputnik so no changes are actually right now allowed because we don't have data in us it has been shown that if somebody is allergic to pfizer they can take moderna or they can take janssen and we have recently seen that covaxin and covid shield are effective against the double mutants of indian strain and uk strain and the brazilian strain whereas covid shield has limited efficacy against the south african strain so this is one more advantage of covaxin over covid shield and the immunity develops at 4 weeks after the first dose but after the first dose antibody is not sufficient to protect against disease after the second dose there is again some controversy that moderna says after 2 weeks after second dose you are protected but uh, various websites about covaxin and covid shield say 4 weeks after the second dose so minimum we have to wait for 4 weeks for covaxin and covid shield for 4 to 8 weeks to be protected so here we are seeing that the vaccination coverage is coming up the second dose has not yet come up in most places and a large number of people are getting vaccinated but we are far from you know the total number we need to produce herd immunity and if you see for a rare change we are finding the male female ratio more or less equal 
and uh, covid shield is the commonest vaccine most people have received and i said as covid shield has limited efficacy compared to covaxin and also not to all strains so we have to be careful with that and vaccination if you see most people most patients who have received are either above 60 and this group is primarily healthcare workers and frontline workers very small number of young people have been vaccinated i would like to acknowledge professor madhu gupta who is our professor in the department of community medicine so she has been actively working on vaccines and has been a part of various trials so i had a lot of discussion with her and also she had shared a couple of slides which i have used and dr daya krishna jha who is our dm senior resident in the department of gastroenterology so it was like a mini seminar for us which both of us prepared together for this audience thank you excellent presentation ma'am you know a lot of practical points covered and i think you know most of the queries have been answered without it over to dr nil arora sir uh, uh may I request dr manish and dr anup to initiate the discussion and comment on the talks dr manish please so this was a wonderful presentation we had a very rigorous uh, discussion on all the four topics that we had today so just two points that i would like to add on here uh practical points that we are seeing so we are seeing lots of patients uh getting admitted uh, after getting completing two doses of vaccination and two weeks after that so the data was shared regarding uh, that 0.04% after vaccination i feel that data is bound to change and it will change soon because we are seeing a lot many more patients post complete vaccination getting infected our internal data is also showing much higher levels so i think it's time now to talk about vaccine effectiveness rather than vaccine efficacy we have all the papers 80 90 percentage and all but real world scenario probably the numbers are going to be much less that is what we are able to see and it shall soon be i think in publications as well so now we need to really see at vaccine effectiveness rather than efficacy second point can i can make a comment here uh, i yes. think manish uh, what you said is right but only thing is you need to also say that the disease severity is much less than unvaccinated versus vaccinated i am coming to that sir i'm yeah. just coming okay. to that okay second point was about disease severity among this group of patients very nicely it was shown uh, we are seeing much less uh, reinfections among those who had natural infection and they are also not landing up, up in the hospitals but we have a good number of patients after complete vaccination who are with us now on ventilators and emergency so severe disease is occurring now the question is uh, there is a theoretical possibility of uh, antibody dependent enhancement so if we are having a immunity from a vaccine uh, whatever it is and now we have a new variant so if are, it might be a heterotypic antibodies which will be partially neutralizing the virus which might be increasing the disease severity we don't know this is just a theory so what we see in dengue this antibody dependent enhancement is something to avoid because a large number of patients uh, are on ventilator are on hfnc even after complete dose of vaccination so this is something that we really need to uh, see in the coming days of this uh, the details to come out so these are the two points and yes as dr tyagi showed natural infection those who have recovered infections are less even hospital admissions are very 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 less so natural infection is the best protection These are the two brief practical points. Yes. Okay. Can I add something to it? Yes, sir. Please. Now, Doctor Sethu, sir. In fact, the severity of the disease has not gone down. I do not know whether it is the backlog which is being seen as on date, but the whole country sees that the ICU beds are totally full, and there is a lot of human cry about the beds there. Probably, maybe the backlog. You know, as I said again, you know, Amit, the efficacy of vaccination. is of course a big question because we do not know that how much is the real efficacy because a good number of people even in our part of the you know country that is in uttarakhand here the same thing is happening you know people getting vaccinated all two doses given even after two months of vaccination they are getting sick going to the ventilator and a good number of our medical fraternity people in fact you know we have lost them over last, over last period so the efficacy of the vaccination i think probably as a uh, Usha Madam had said very clearly and good one. Probably the Pfizer and Moderna has got a real good efficacy system. Our vaccine, in fact, has got a very low efficacy. If we 
take the impact factor of the vaccination, I think, you know, it could be grade three or grade four, not grade one. Uh, I, I think uh, I'll ask Manish, what could be the syndrome after, you know, vaccination, the way they develop? It may not be actually a COVID infection. Is it something else that is happening? Uh, no, they're, uh, presenting typically, so we have seen so many patients uh, one month, two months after complete vaccination. So these are, they are invariably mostly they are healthcare workers actually because they got vaccinated early. We will come to know in coming months what's happening uh, more on this. But we are seeing after a month, two months, they are coming with illness which is requiring admission. And sometimes even our professor had this had to go on HFNC and all recover. So we had a typical COVID uh, cytokine storm and typical disease course. What actually surprised me is that the disease is entirely limited to the lung. Interestingly, we don't see much of hepatic or renal or a bit of cardiac, of course, in neurological. All they've been described, but we don't see them. So uh, is there a difference between the syndrome, which is an actual COVID, and the one which comes after a couple of doses of vaccine? Uh, is there a different syndrome that we are seeing? Because these could be even antibody positive. When we tested some of our sick patients, they're even antibody positive. Yes, yes sir. So, in, in clinically, we are not seeing any difference. But in the first wave, we did uh, did minimally invasive tissue sampling in patients who expired. And uh, uh, we saw very, very few involvement of uh, the, um, uh, the cytopathic effect of the virus in other organs. Even in the myocardium, we didn't see anything. No myocarditis, nothing. Renal, very few. Liver, very few. So it is predominantly only lungs. Uh, we don't have data from current wave, but uh, clinically, they appear to be same, sir. Yeah, uh, I can I answer, Dr. Setu Babu? Can I comment on that? Yeah, please, sir. Please. You see, I think what Dr. Manish has raised is a very important and pertinent issue. There are two ways the virus enters into the cell. One is an ACE2 receptor mediated endocytosis, and second is something which he was alluding to. This is called antibody enhancement cytotoxicity. What it means is that antibody is an FC receptors, and this FC receptor helps the virus after attaching to the antibody to get entry into the cell. So it has been shown that people who die of a CV disease. This antibody, high levels of antibody, it all not all, this may not be neutralizing. This may be heteropathic antibody, as Dr. Manish said. This may be causing more injury to the lung. The reason why lung is primarily involved is because by default, once you have an attachment of the virus onto the ACE2 receptor, there is a down regulation of the ACE2 receptor and ACE1 goes up. Once ACE1 goes up, you have a lot of angiotensin 1, which increases the pulmonary vascular permeability increases the exudation and injury. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely the reason why down regulation of ACE2, which is by default a protective mechanism for the lung. So there is a decreased surfactant once you injure and down regulate the ACE2, thereby leading to increased level of ACE2, which leads to increased angiotensin 1, which causes increased permeability of the vasculature of the pulmonary system. So in high level of antibody, which causes antibody enhancement of the entry of this virus into the cell coupled with down regulation of the ACE2 receptor may explain what you are saying. So what happens to interferon in these people? Because that's what probably children and adults differ even in their interferon response. Yeah. You see, interferon response, yeah. Anybody Sorry. wants to make it? Yeah. So interferon, you, you, you have some comment on interferon? Because these people, some do produce interferon, some do not produce interferon, and that makes a difference. The severe, severe disease people produce less interferon, those who have very bad disease. But those who have milder disease produce good amount of interferons. You see, I, as that's, I showed that's you. That's another one of the reasons why children get lesser of a less serious illness. Yeah, interferon is the first line of defense in trying to neutralize the intracytoplasmic components of the virus. So if you have a low interferon response, you will have a huge amount of the virus which is popping out into the surrounding tissues to which the pro-inflammatory cells and the antigen presenting cells are going to react. So an early interferon response is the key to contain the viral infection. A low interferon response means high the viral load in the vicinity of the cell. So Usha, how, yes, what, how much Usha. interferon sir, what do you think will need be? Like as Zydus says that, you know, a single shot 
will be effective you know i mean no, no. that exogenous it's not it's not about how much yeah. the point is that's a pregnant pharaoh timing pregnant pharaoh you a, give it early and then it has to be given within the first 7 days so you don't have enough time to give the second shot it's nothing to do with the amount you are uh, so that is what you know, so i mean should it be given globally to each and every person in the first week or we should wait for the severity to come in no no if you wait if it has to be given it has to be given in yes usha you are saying sir uh you are mute you are mute yeah definitely with the zydus thing i think it is just a new thought and it is sufficient to that we should know that we should explore this thought and not jump to conclusions and if at all we have to boost the interferon response we should boost it at the onset not once the severe disease comes because the severe disease is a completely different pathogenic model so we should use interferon if we have to at the earliest children have a very good interferon response and that is why they have a very subclinical kind of a disease and in india i do believe that people over 40 have had so much of exposure to infections that our memory t cells are actually lesser than in the active state compared to an average person in other countries uh maybe the developed country so i think though we are getting an antibody response to the uh, to the vaccination but maybe our t cell is not as robust and we are not able to mount a complete adaptive immune response when we even when we give vaccination so that is why i think masking will stay and social distancing has to stay on until we can you know boost up our immune response in our population you know it would be interesting to see as to those who have had natural infection and those who have had vaccination complete vaccination as we say as to how the curve dips down and when does it reach a zero level meaning thereby that you know you have had the infection at 4 weeks you had 20 people at 6 weeks 8 weeks then 10 weeks you didn't have because we neither have for covid shield the second dose when it should be given nor do we have a consensus on when does the protection start so perhaps where you are seeing more case cases and you start seeing those who got both injections shots or to just irritate the setu babu jabs so how when would you come down to a level which is you know minimal and moreover you know we are seeing more health workers but mind you the health worker a uh, ja- uh, injection started around 16th of january it was very less so basically 8 weeks would be completed only in middle of april and majority of us actually got it much later we got it somewhere in feb of the so it would be may now that they would be you know sort of getting the good protection if they were to get it yes sir sure. that that comes to another point you know till now we have never explored the role of boosters so we have a vaccine which is giving us 70 to 80% efficacy and whether at 6 months since healthcare workers are going to be continuously exposed to patients whether there would be a role of boosters in these patients yeah, yeah. Uh, another act, sorry. point dr tyagi is that you know when you talk of interferon induced response you see in the very instance the first response of interferon is related to the incoming virus and the maximum viral shedding occurs 12 hours prior to the onset of the fever so if ever you have to give interferon it has to be given as early as possible because after that interferon loses its role once the virus has multiplied enough and gone gone out then it is all a ball game which is maintained and then perpetuated by immunological response so you once, have to give it very early then regular insulin should be regular interferon should be better than peg interferon yes yeah absolutely are you going to say that no yeah, but they have what about the uh, triple variant system which is happening in india now and how do you fight with that so yeah, that triple variant is that you know at more the more the virus uh, absolutely uh, grows as this is going to have more and more areas where it's going to you know uh, mutate so it is going to mutate and more what i would like to ask our experts you know about this 2dg you know which are drdo has uh, developed what is exactly that 
Does it yes. really mean that the glucose is the real food, you know, where the virus replicates? So if you stop the glucose to the virus, it is not going to replicate further? Yeah, I, I had a question to Usha. Usha, how long does the if immunity generated by vaccines last? Like for other vaccines, we have so, so many variables, the nutritional fact, status of our population, and then for the healthcare workers getting reinfection, maybe the inoculum also would matter. A healthcare worker is likely to be exposed to a much larger inoculum, whereas non-healthcare worker will be stray. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we are saying our ICMR is saying 0.04% reinfection. I know that in PGI, we have about 4,000 healthcare workers, probably 70, 80% have been infected. There is no attempt so far to track reinfection. Neither, I am told, is at the national level when a person gets reinfected, when he goes, any person who, he go, who is registered as infected, there is no question asked to him whether you have been vaccinated or not. So I believe that those figures of reinfection are based upon very small data, which has been closely monitored. But the real world figure is much different. And uh, my question was related to booster dose. Do we have data from other vaccines, if not from Covishield and Covaxin, that do we require a booster and when? Yes, sir. all these are very pertinent issues. And mm -hmm. as you also know that the data is very limited. However, people haven't done, you know, long term longitudinal studies to see how long the antibody lasts. So I'll have to look at that aspect uh, again to see whether any study has looked at the duration of antibody response. And definitely, just like how hepatitis B, there's a concept of booster. We have to see whether we should be measuring our antibody levels and see if it is below a particular threshold. Would there be a need of booster? Because these are very important issues. And I think healthcare workers are partially protected because they are you know, cognizant of the fact that they can get infection, so they are masked. But I'm worried about the public at large, which will think that they are vaccinated and uh, they can demask themselves. That is the big worry in our country. Yeah, Dr. Kochal, we have a corresponding data from SARS-CoV-1 infection. The total immunity lasts for a period of only up to two years. After that, it just wanes off. Maybe same thing may be happening. Can I ask Dr. Manish and Dr. Anoop, what do they think about the DRDO com com uh, uh, they, yeah. they are planning, tanning, so trying to come out with the 2D, 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 2D. 2D oxyglucose. Yeah. What is the status? Anoop and not money. No idea, in fact. I have no idea about that. Uh, I, I, the, the action is very peculiar. I saw the DRDO in, uh, you know, um, uh, CEO interview and all. I think this glucose is particularly absorbed by the cells infected and they make glucose. This glucose is interpreted by the virus as food. And I think that looks like uh, an explanation. I'm not convinced that it is so easy that, uh, you know, it's neither antiviral nor uh, anti-replicative nor anti-inflammatory. I, I, the action seems to be something difficult, like a depletion of nutrition for the multiplying virus. Doesn't seem to be very tenable. And the data is based upon 260 patients, which, which you know, uh, out of 260, 130 in each, um, you would expect one mortality in each group. So how can that data be of any value? And by the way, this was initiated a year ago by our great Baba Ramdev. So hmm. I think all of us will add a big pinch of yeah. not only salt, but much more to that. Right. Dr. Manish, you'd like to comment on that? Yes, sir. So this was basically like starving the cells who are uh, metabolically more active. So this mm -hmm. has been uh, tried since two decades in malignancies, various malignancies. So it has Radiation. never been shown to have any uh, benefit. I really don't know in an infection, how will it uh, uh, work? Actually, so the basic in radiation of, sick cells. Yeah, the basic concept of 2DG is that in the sixth carbon atom of the glucose molecule, you remove the oxygen from the second position. So from OH, you just make it H. That is the reason it is called 2-deoxyglucose. So once the cell which is multiplying, 
yeah once the cell which is multiplying it primarily is dependent on the glycolysis and since most of this glucose has to go via a process of getting converted into pyruvate before it is utilized so that is what preferentially the virus uses and hence theoretically it suppresses the rapid application of the virus i don't know how much it translates into practical aspects they say that it is giving a false false uh, food hero to the virus that is what they say so it is called they say che cheating the cheater cheating that's the what cheater. the frame they used yeah, cheating the, the cheating the cheater that questions on this because the immune cells are also rapidly multiplying whenever mm. there is infection yes so the they're also going to cheat our uh, defense people so i think drdo has made this but i think uh, it has to look at how it is going to neutrophils and lymphocyte function how it gets affected i think it is we are, we are very good at che cheating the cheater that we agree it is cheating <laughs> the cheating the country by you know blowing it up in such a way without authentic data so let me ask you a very sensitive question are we happy with remdesivir about remdesivir are we happy we continue i i you know i happened to look at uh, pubmed yesterday only yeah there are about 1200 papers on this drug in the last one year and 568 odd papers this year in the last four months the nijm editorial is probably critical uh, yes but most of the data suggests that if given at the right time not only it reduces the duration of illness but See, if you look at the first nigm paper it benefited the it they looked at the duration of illness but if you look at the heart data it reduced mortality as well hospital so was 0.76 or 67 hospital stay they said it reduces by 2 to 3 to 5 days yes but you look at the data closely the mortality for mortality the odds ratio was 0.67 so it did help in that if you give it the first 2 3 days uh, for our people our covid experts in pgi say that up to 7 days and a person who requires oxygen is the ideal candidate so you combine steroids and remdesivir at that level i just wanted to make a comment on another point which dr kochar had raised that we may be under reporting reinfection i think uh, the reinfection may be a very mild fever which Correct. even the person may ignore it and will feel that this is not covid because he thinks he is vaccinated may not present for you know testing so definitely our reinfection rates will be under reported in our country Uh, i have a question to dr mahesh and Mahir. it's just that, as well if we are if the reinfection is going to be just a common cold yes yeah, it, but you may be transmitting it you know yes, in that, that sense that you may be transmitting it dr usha uh, there is some suggestion mm -hmm. the day you get the second vaccine you may have a hyper immune response and if you are harboring if you already ha have the virus you are exposed to the virus that may cause a flare up of the disease at that stage do you have any thing on that yes sir the uh, covid shield vaccine and the covaxin vaccine because these are you know uh, elicits an antibody response to a large number of proteins there can be uh, you know a sudden step up of immune response which can trigger things in a negative way for the human body so there is some evidence that these particular vaccines can create uh, have a when you are harboring infection and you are given the vaccine because that can be a mismatch at that time you see one of the pri uh, urban primary health centers here in merat suddenly we were seeing lot of patients who reported that they got third day fourth day they got covid after the first vaccination it also so happened that about 70% of their staff also got the infection and it turned out that one part of that urban health center was doing covid testing and the other half was doing vaccination so basically the there was a mixing of people between those who came for testing which were pre test probability was high of having covid 
versus those who came with the uh, the idea of getting the vaccination so third fourth day Thank after you. the incubation that's what they were getting added on to that your hyperimmune status at that time you could have the illness and so basically uh, this concept that you have at the same place was not a very good idea they've changed that now but i'm sure there would be several centers where this is going on Ashish had a question. Ashish, you want yeah. to ask? <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to ask because um, Dr. Manish had said said that many people who have va who are vaccinated, fully vaccinated, they still got the disease. They still got severe disease. Went to the ventilator. Is there any data with which vaccine this is uh, seen more? With whether with co vaccine or whether ninety percent would be would be co the the two are in not comparable. Yeah, so, so, Covid shield. Uh, we have seen a good number of people going to the vaccine. because you've seen Covid shield in good numbers. Covid so, shield. We have seen here in there. Doctor Manish, you have some. So uh, uh, our data shows both vaccines. Uh, we are seeing severe cases after both vaccines. I think equally because our center was co vaccine and we cater to a, a large population near around which is Covid shield. So we are getting both Covid shield post co vaccine uh, severe diseases. We Do you check the antibody levels? Can I can I intervene? Manish, yes. so yeah. do you check their antibody levels? Uh, in, to in some in some patients, we did, and they had antibody levels which are upper level. So they did by various methods above ten. So number of right. them had antibody levels very high. So that's why this fear whether this is ADE happening with so such a good antibody level, why they are landing upon ventilator. So that is the fear that uh, since the vaccination is increasing now, we will really need to see what happens. See, earlier we were talking right. about what is called zero conversion versus zero protection. I think one thing is happening and one thing is not happening. Uh, Dr. Manish, I have a question for you. So do you think the people who have had the vaccination, should they be put on steroids earlier than the ones which we consider in other patients without vaccination? Uh, no, ma'am, I don't think we have any data to uh, suggest that way. And first peak of illness again, obviously. So the problem we are facing practically is that patients are being put on steroids in day one or two of symptoms. And uh, some and these patients are very hard. When they are coming to the hospital after six, seven, eight days when they are desaturating, they have been taking steroids, good doses in the first week of illness. As I was pointed out, this will lead to increased viral replication. And these patients are uh, very difficult to manage. They are going, having a progressive cytokine storm, probably the viral replication, which was enhanced in the first peak due to steroid, that is fueling the cytokine storm later on, and they are very difficult to manage. So I don't think we would be in a position to say whether to use steroids more in this group of post-vaccination men. As of uh, no, Can I intervene at this stage? Yeah. You see, there is hardly any data to prove that those who are vaccinated have a milder disease. In fact, we are seeing enough number of cases after vaccination coming with severe disease. So that data is also not there. I can give you a small sample from our own department. Before vaccination, seven of our resident and faculty members, they developed disease during the last surge. They all had mild disease. This time, 16 plus 2, 18, 18 of our residents and faculty, they developed COVID. In the second surge, most of them, apart um, except two, those who are not vaccinated, all of them have taken vaccination. Few COVID shield and few Covaxin. All had same type of disease. So neither the previous lot had severe disease, nor the present one. So we can't say that vaccine is preventing severe disease at this moment, at least. Number two, the lot of emphasis has been given on one point that. Those who have developed disease, even they should take vaccine. Here I would like to quote one paper. One paper was quoted by Dr. I think Dr. Thyagi in his uh, in his deliberation. That is from NEGM, where they have clearly shown that naturally acquired infection provide better immunity. Then there is a very good paper in Science from uh, Jennifer Dan Group, where they have followed these patients after infection. And they studied various compartments of immunological, circulating immunological memory in these patients. What they have seen that the six months post-infection IgG 
to the spike protein was relatively stable over six months. Same is true for B cells also, specific for spike protein. And only uh, CD4 T cells and CD8 cells, they declined after three to five months. So the same thing you see in vaccinated people also. So here I would like to say that naturally acquired infection will provide better immunity and probably at this stage, we should not recommend vaccination in them because vaccine is also in short supply. So instead of using that vaccine for those where we can protect them, here these people are already protected. So there is no advantage of giving vaccine, especially in those who have already acquired infection. This is my one point. Dr. Jayanti's comment on Dr. Anup Sarah's observation. I was also wondering whether we should check the antibodies, you know, uh, after vaccination. Like, for instance, if I've taken COVID shield, should I check my antibody to know because the response is it was just 70 72 percent? And I think I agree with Dr. Anup Sarai. I think the requirement of vaccination is going to become fairly less now. To, to, we can withhold the vaccination for the group which has already been infected because they are going to have an immunity at least for the next four to five months. So I think the vaccination requirement should be more for those who have not been infected at all. These are we, a group that has been infected where they can hold on and they will have a much, much better immunity than the group which has uh, not been vaccinated. But my problem, ma'am, with the antibody testing is there are two types of antibodies which are available. One is against the spike protein and second is again the RBD, that is the receptor binding domain. We still do not know what we measure in which test and which is neutralizing and what titer. So is there any relevance of testing this level of antibodies? Are we sure which antibody which we are measuring? Is it neutralizing? What is the cutoff titer? Anybody would like to comment? I think the knowledge is very good. Yes, cool. It's generally believed yes, to be yes, about sir. 10. Each laboratory has its own interpretation. For instance, before my vaccination, I thought I may have acquired last year. So I just checked. So the antibodies were negative. So I do not know. They did look for the spike and the other one. So one like in hepatitis B, you know, if you have more than 10 or more than 100, you are protected. Nobody knows whether we are talking of anti-spike antibody or anti-RBD antibody. There are different kits which look at different aspects. Different labs have, are doing different ways of testing. So we do not know what antibodies they're taking up. If there are uh, no more questions, I think we have already exceeded far beyond the stipulated time. May I request uh, the, Dr. Setu, you have the last comment? No, no, no. I think it was a great, uh, it was a learning experience to, uh, it's, 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 it's really learning. Thank you, Anil. I need to- Dr. Ashish, can you summarize? Arora, yeah. Dr. Aroda, you- Considering the questions which have been raised, you need one more session. <laughs> yeah, that is I'm going to. That is what I'm going to announce. First of all, uh, let Dr. Ashish conclude before we finally come up to our next uh, new session after about two to four weeks. I'm going to declare about the contents of that. Ashish, you can summarize. Yeah. And then... it's, it Thank has you. been an excellent discussion on uh, such a relevant topic uh, about vaccine and immune immune response to infection as well as vaccine. Although we did answer a lot of questions, I think, but uh, much more questions have been generated and our uh, knowledge is still very poor. And I think we will require many such sessions and discussions, long discussions, before we can say that we have sufficient knowledge about that. Uh, I would like to extend vote of thanks to all the audience i think we have uh, 700 800 uh, which uh, registrations that time I, I do not know have the full number but uh, for attending such uh, uh, long session and such in uh, attending such discussion and uh, generating so much of uh, uh, discussion and i would li I like to thank all the chairpersons all the moderators and the speakers for uh, the lively discussion bringing up out all the information which we being a gastroenterologist, we were not aware with, uh, but our knowledge in this pandemic has increased and with this uh, discussion also has increased. And last but not least, we I would like to thank our academic partners, uh, Micro Labs, for arranging this. I would hand over to Dr. Anil Agra for uh, announcing the further. Ian, I am extremely thankful uh, from the core of my heart to the learned 
colleagues, uh, faculty members, and the moderators, chairperson, and especially Dr. Jayanti for having spared their valuable time on this weekend for enlivening the session. I agree with Dr. Kocher that it has fueled more unanswered question than one, the question which could be answered. And uh, as per that suggestion, we are going to have another seminar soon by Daily Liver Foundation in which we are going to discuss the role of vaccination in our spatial population, which will include patients who are immunosuppressed, pregnancy, those with chronic liver disease, those with the immunosuppressed states, and those with underlying malignancy. With that, I am thankful to everybody, including our uh, pharmacology partners. Thank you so much. Good night and goodbye and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank